Good evening and welcome to the October 27th, 2014 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. If you would all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before I start this evening, I just do want to apologize. We're running a few minutes late. The planning board had a workshop this evening on the new cell tower ordinance that the, the uh, town council has passed. And I want to uh, thank Jay and Dan, our town planner and assistant planner, uh, for their efforts this evening. It really brought, shed some light on it for us. So I thank you for that. Having said that now, could we please have the roll call? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Buffard? Mr. Paul? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. And Mr. Mather? Here. Our next item on the agenda this evening is the approval of minutes of October 6, 2014. I move to approve. Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Point of Order, would you like to make me a voting member this evening? Yes, I can make you a voting member this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, due to the fact that Mr. Buffard is not here, uh, please make it known that Nick is, in fact, a voting member this evening. Thank you, sir. Uh, discussion on minutes. Any discussion on the minutes? No. Seeing none, all in favor? And I show that to be unanimous. Item number four this evening, Foster Farm Subdivision 2, Habitat for Humanity, a Humanity of Greater Portland, requests a preliminary review for a 13-lot subdivision off Broad Turn Road. Mr. Chase. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you just know, this is for a 13-lot uh, single-family subdivision off Broad Turn Road. The uh, subject property is in the VR2 zone. This application has been before the board on a, a couple of occasions. Uh, once as a sketch plan, um, you conducted a preliminary discussion about this item. A couple of meetings ago, it was on your agenda at the last meeting, at which time the applicant requested to be tabled uh, to be able to make some adjustments based on prior comments. Um, just by way of brief background for uh, as a reminder to board members and those of the public who may be interested, uh, this. The uh, subject property was purchased by the town of Scarborough in 2006 for the stated purpose of uh, providing for uh, an affordable housing opportunity in town as well as uh, to maintain the preponderance of the property as uh, passive uh, natural area open space, trails and the like. Um, and so the plan before you is sort of the, um, is, is that that notion, in concept anyway, uh, coming forward. Uh, prior to coming to the board, the applicant, applicant's team held a few meetings, I know with the neighborhood, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, resident, residents to come up with uh, the general concepts for development. Um, so that's just a bit of background. Again, as I mentioned, uh, this item had been before you before. And really one of the big questions the board had at the last meeting was really the design of the open space. As board members will recall, one of the design elements in the VR2 is to provide for open space, that is both natural areas and passive, like we talked about, which is really sort of about 15 of, eight of the acres are proposed to be remained as such. There's also a component that speaks to having active open space, and the intent there is that the VR2 allows for very small lots, um, clustered housing, um, and the, the, the idea is to allow for some type of active recreational area that may not otherwise be able to be accommodated on the smaller lots that are permitted uh, within the zone. And so again, at, at the board's last discussion, there was some uh, discussion around uh, the location of that active space and how that was designed. I know the applicants, I believe, prepared to sort of walk through a couple iterations. Uh, I know we worked on some guidance from the board and, uh, and how they wound up at their proposal. Um, so I think that's really the, the biggest item that staff had in, in our comments. The other elements uh, that we touched on were just uh, 
greater clarification around uh, the allowed activities within the 75-foot stream setback and really having an understanding of, of what has been looked at through the DEP per permitting process. Um, and then again, just uh, uh, a final discussion about sort of the, the open space and the future uh, uses, ownership, uh, and um, uh, uh, activities on those open spaces. So with that, I would turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, here tonight seeking preliminary approval for the Foster Farms um, subdivision for the Habitat for Humanity. Um, as Jay had mentioned, um, we're, we tabled at the last meeting um, due to some back and forth we had had kind of, we took some direction from the board and moved that open space kind of that it was one of the lots and we'd switched it with the lot that's furthest to the northeast, closest to the Saratoga Lane subdivision. Um, by doing so and trying to fit a lot of parking as trailhead parking to <coughs> access the remaining open space to the northern part of this subdivision, um, we kind of ran roughshod over the intent of the zoning ordinance where it calls for common space and, and village green space. Um, and that kind of led us into a discussion back with, with Jay and Dan to kind of rethink what we are doing and, and put that open space central area kind of back into the middle of the proposed subdivision and reduce the, the amount of trailhead parking because as you may or, or may not recall, the end of Saratoga Lane, at the end of that, there's some parking to access the same parcel of land. Um, and there's a trail system that starts from back there. So I think we were a little overzealous in the amount of trailhead parking we were trying to accommodate. So we, we went ahead with something that was a little less um, intrusive, and, and you can see that's kind of between the, um, the the open space to kind of to the northwest, where that sliver of wetlands slides up into our site. Um, so that I think <laughs> is the big issue that we were kind of wrestling with, and I think we've addressed in, in meeting with with Jay and Dan. Um, the second issue is the the open space and, and clarifying what that open space is. Um, Jay and I had a chance to talk today about how that open space may be divvied up in the future. Right now, the way we're showing it is that there's the right away for the road, <coughs> all the individual lots in the subdivision, and all the remaining land is being called open space. Um, to some degree that works, some degree it doesn't because there's home ownership um, association that's going to maintain a lot of this area around the road, the stormwater system, um, and the lines that connect to the stormwater system. So the thinking is that ultimately there will be two types of open space. There will be homeownership association owned open space and town of Scarborough owned open space. And kind of the line we're thinking is right around in the center line of that stream. To the south would be all open space owned by the homeownership association. Everything to the north of that would be owned by the town of Scarborough. Um, I think that makes sense um, to some degree. It's, it's similar to a lot of other subdivisions when we grant land back to the town after the subdivision, you know, when we're getting to the end of it, um, it it's very similar to that. Um, with that, the remainder of the comments we received were very, you know, technical, very simple to, to address, and I'd offer it back to the board for any questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't have a couple of comments. You held public comment yeah. on this item Already. previously, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I think what I'd like to do is turn this over to the board at this point and ask Mr. McGee, our voting member this evening, to start us <laughs> off. I, I guess um, just real quick to clarify, the easements you have going through the properties and how many how many drainage drains are through there? It's, they're cleanouts, correct? What is that, is that the purpose of those easements? What what they are is in order to to use the the low impact development technique of of Picking up the water as it runs off the roofs, we're using drip edge filters. So it's basically crushed stone that runs through a filter to an underdrain. In order, if there, this not, the site is relatively flat. In order to pick up all those that clean water and discharge it, we had to run a basically a, a drain line that collects all those underdrains from all the houses and discharge it to a point where the grade drops off enough that we can daylight that pipe. Okay. And the. And that is that is all homeowner association responsibility. Correct. Okay. Um, I think that's that's pretty much the extent of my questions thus far. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ogden. Um, I'm very confused. Okay. October 
hand <coughs> letter from Jay. Um, there was a note which may have been addressed already. So forgive me if, if it is. There was a on page two. There was a comment on uh, spring setback, and it says note S11 is the kind of standard note related to the no buffer, no disturbed buffer areas. However, there does not appear to be any no disturbed buffer shown, and the answer is note S11 has been removed because no no disturbed buffer is proposed. Correct. There's going to be no there, no disturbed buffers here. <coughs> Correct. It's it's being a comp. There's no need for a no disturbed buffer. It's being accomplished with open space. With open space. Okay, and this is going to be in open space. This is very clearly everybody knows you don't go in and cut trees. I mean. Correct. Yeah, there'll be as part of the homeowner association documents. There'll be what you can do in the open space and what you can't do. The open space is meant for passive and active recreation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's meant for stormwater treatment, and that's it. Okay, sometimes this works really easily and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm just putting it out there that this is a lot of houses clustered, not a lot of houses, it's a very close clustering of houses. And I think that that open space is going to be pretty intensely used just because there's not much in the way of yards and you don't want to let the streets play if you're a kid, so why not? It's this open space. Um, just want to make sure that it's highlighted that this is an important part of this of this subdivision is the use, the careful use of the open space. That's my only concern about this. Other than that, I have no problems. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I build on Ms. Uglis's question? Because I do think, I mean, that, that's one of the areas, you're sort of touching on one of the areas where staff still would like some further clarification. Because on the subdivision plan, they're still shown a 75-foot stream setback. And within that 75-foot stream, Setback. There's sort of a diff the DEP regulates things differently, and, and maybe um, I'll have the applicant sort of describe that more in detail than I will. But essentially, from the first 25 feet are more heavily regulated. From 25 to 75 feet, you can do more activities in that area. And in that area, uh, right now, the applicant have proposed to put some of their stormwater facilities, and some of that. 25 to 70 foot area is within at least two of the building envelopes. And it's just, I want to be sure there's clarity on the final subdivision plan about what type of uses the applicant is getting permitted through the DEP <coughs> within that 75 foot setback. So I think that um, maybe this would be a good time to jump on that point. That's part of what I'm looking for. Yeah. Because there's so much happening with this land, so many different things happening. So as part of our permitting process through the DEP, we have three layers of permits that we're mm -hmm. going after. The first part, as Jay mentioned, there's a layers from zero to 25 feet. Um, no dis that's no there's, there's no disturbed, no touch. That's off limits. The 25 to 75 feet, there's activities allowed provided you do certain things. You're careful with erosion control, that sort of thing. That's all permitted through the permit by rule process, which mm -hmm. we have submitted for. Um, the second permit we're looking for is the, the Natural Resource Protection Act permit, the Tier 1 for our wetland fill. That's been filed for the both the wetlands that we're filling on the entrance road. Um, so that's been filed. And then the third permit is the DEP stormwater permit, uh, which we've also filed, and that's to, because we're disturbing more than an acre of land and we have more than 20,000 square feet of impervious area, we have to um, show how we're treating stormwater. So there's, there's restrictions with each one of those permits that will be part of this approval. So we can't come back for final approval until we have all those permits in hand. Okay. I just think it's very complex, and it's, yep. it's I, I want to, I'm not sure how I'm going to say this. This is new to us, a, a situation like this. Many of these people, I would think, are going to be perhaps first-time homeowners, and this is not an easy environment. And this has got a lot of complicated things going on at land use-wise, so I'm just going to want to make sure that the developer has some kind of really good system in place for educating everybody who is going to be part of this community? I can tell you as, as the owners, we were just talking with a developer from Habitat for Humanity. As, as a Habitat for Humanity owner, you have to go through a training session where you actually school, you put sweat equity into the house, you have to work on other houses. So there's a, there's a lot of that education process that happens through okay. Habitat. That, that makes me feel better. 
So they'll actually be out there working on the land, and they'll see what it is firsthand. Okay. Right. I feel better. And, and I do think that if the board does feel comfortable with the preliminary plans, moving forward to final staff's expectation would be that the notations on the plans are enhanced um, to mm. spell out. I think there's a note right now references, rightfully so, that uh, DEP permit is pending. I think it would be helpful to have that note spelled out. We have stormwater permit. XYZ number, you know, lay out the permit numbers. Right. This type of activity is allowed within the 25-foot setback. Exactly. This type of activity That's is allowed. That's caught my eye. I yep. mean, there's got to be no disturbed so, buffers, but it actually is a matter of, of definition. Yep. And who's, exactly. who's definitions. Exactly. And so, I don't, you know, I mean, yep. it gets very complex. It does. Let's make it easy. And it is complex, and I think, you know, through the, through the okay. process, we can be sure that's clarified. Now. Great. I'm all done. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Mr. Mazur. Yeah, a couple of things, and I'm still a little confused, but really work with me. Um, what about easements? There was some question the last time we this was brought up about easements between the homeowners association and uh, and the town. It's it, um, I don't want to put this carefully. It all the, based on the discussion Jay and I had today, depending on the ownership, as you know, if if the open space is owned by the homeowners. The homeowners can't give themselves an easement over their own land. They, they already have the rights to it. They own it. So by that definition, there's going to be easements, some easements to the town of Scarborough. There's going to be some easements to the homeowners to have rights to get across the lots, but not necessarily the open space. Uh, the long and short of it is by the time we get to final, we're going to have that resolved. <coughs> it's going to be clearly spelled out. Okay. So I'm... It hasn't been totally spelled out. Not at this point, not okay, yet. So I'm not way off in Never Never Land. Uh, parking. I, yeah. I guess I missed that. Okay, How does so that now stand? The, the dark brown area that we show, we've allowed parking for two vehicles, um, and then there's access along that kind of light gray area to the trails to get into the back of that property. Um, the discussion was that this doesn't need to be a, a gigantic trailhead parking area that two parking spaces should be enough. If those somebody's in there looking to get access to that, there's always that other trailhead parking at the end of the cul-de-sac on Saratoga Lane. Okay, and uh, I, I know I, I read it in here, but uh, for comment, uh, street width, heavy emergency vehicles width of the area, that was another issue that came up, street width. I thought we'd resolve that at the last meeting, but we went to 22 feet width, which is slightly wider than what's been allowed on other projects with uh, the, uh, the Cape Cod basically <coughs> curbing that allows um, easily for cars to get up on the, on the side if they need to. Um, that's different than, we talked about the 20 foot wide with the vertical curb. That's which what they, I was referring Right. This is 22 feet with uh, Cape Cod curbing. And our public safety department has weighed in and they're comfortable with the proposed design. Thank you. Uh, public works. Let's see, the setbacks we'll talk about, uh, easement, uh, setback, open space, which has been discussed, uh, DBP permits, I'm all done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Major. Mr. DuPont. You know, I've got the next step where you certainly want to see the homeowners association covenants yes. clearly so we can understand that language. Yep. Other than that, I'm okay. All right, thank you, John. Mr. Fellows. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just amplify what uh, John just said about the the uh, documents, and uh, beyond that, I think the the key items needing clarification for final have been pretty well identified, so I don't really have anything to add. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess, Lee, the, the one thing that I don't know that I've ever seen, and I'm not exactly sure how you're going to do this, but there are at least three different lots, lot seven, lot eight, and I believe lot 13, where you have an easement going through a building envelope. How okay. do you do that? What we do is just trim the building envelope to where the easement is, because the easement line would be more restrictive, so basically the building envelope shrinks to where that easement is. But then you've got building envelope behind the easement in some cases, or Oh, I, so 
Well, point. I think from a practicality standpoint, you have to look at each one of those case by case and say, is there anything that you could even put back there? Does what? it make sense? Or do you just truncate it all together and say that's just not a buildable area and keep all the building envelope contiguous? I, that I concur with. So I guess what I'm saying is it just seems weird that we would have on the plan we're showing a building envelope where you don't ever have any intentions of a, of a building. Right. So what we do is, in that case, we trim it and make sure that it's just one contiguous building envelope and, and clean that up so that it's clear. And it'll be okay. On. It'll be on the final. The only caution I might put into that, because I, I can definitely appreciate where you're coming from, Mr. Chairman, on that point, because that, that's one I hadn't thought of. But one thing I, I do want to just be cognizant of is if a property owner would wishes to put a shed on their property and the subdivision plan identifies that back triangle as being a location where you couldn't put a building, they may not, they, they would come to our code officer and our code officer would, it, it becomes difficult when we, when we don't, when lots don't just follow our standard zoning right. ordinances. So I, I can appreciate your concern about sort of the overlapping, if you will, of an easement area and a building envelope, but it may get more complicated, quite frankly, for the code officer and future property owners if we start to become too specific per lot, if you sort of yeah. catch my... And I guess that's where I was going on case by case, because uh, um, that one with the big triangle in the back, there's definitely room to... I mean, you could even put a garage back there, a detached garage. There's, there's probably room enough for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lot 8 clearly has that. I guess my concern is more on, like, Lot 7 and Lot 13, where I want to make sure that somebody doesn't build on it yeah. well, because it is the easement. Yeah. And it's harder to define that given the building envelope that's shown on the drawing. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's my point. That. More so than the one that you're, right. that you're referring to. So th that was, I guess, my concern other than... Uh, what we're seeing, I, I understand what you know, moving around the open space and what you're trying to do, and trailhead parking, and um, you, you know, assuming that we get the DEP permitting that you've put in for all of that stuff, just all seems to kind of add up. And if we add notes of clarification and stuff that we've talked about on the setbacks, then yep. I think that brings us to about where we want to be. Right. So, Chairman. Yes. One more. Uh, Street lighting out towards the main road. I didn't yeah. see anything on the plans that I have. Is there intention for a street light out there? There is an intention for a street light at the intersection of Broad Turn and, and this road, yes. Okay. It'll be a Cobra head didn't, style. Didn't see it on here, that's all. Yeah. yeah yes, Matt? Just, this might be more for staff. Is the 20 foot easement for the, for the clean house and stuff, is that standard? I mean, could it be smaller? Could it be 12 feet? It's going to be to the homeowners association, the town. Is, so I think that was one of the comments we had. It was referenced to be to the town or to the home. The town wants no part of these. Right. These are private. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I can tell you where we got 20 feet from. So. It's, you know, assume five or six feet for a trench box and then assume a one-to-one -one slope up and the pipe is buried five feet down. So that if you do the quick math, if it's down five feet, five feet on either side, you got 16, 18 feet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Just a clarification. <coughs> on your point, how did that get left? Are we going to just leave the lots as they are presented on this plan I with with, all, with the easement question to be taken up at the time of construction? I think lot 8, there'll be some defining there in terms of two separate building so envelopes, but I think on lot 7 and lot 13, if I'm reading into this, He's going to change it so that the building envelope isn't shown as part of the easement. Okay. Correct. So that will be created before you come back. Correct. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. Anything else? All right. Then I'd like to move to approve the preliminary plan of mm -hmm. Foster Farm Subdivision 2 as presented. Final plan set shall address comments raised by staff, peer reviewers, and the planning board. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And I show that to be unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Our next item this evening, Waterhouse Acres Subdivision, Richard Waterhouse, requests a preliminary review for a three-lot subdivision off West Beach Ridge Road. Mr. Chase. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> As you just identified, this is a an application for a three-lot subdivision off of West Beach Ridge Road. Um, the underlying or the zoning in this area is uh, RF zoning, and given the characteristics of the site, the applicant is before you for a conservation subdivision um, lay with a conservation subdivision uh, layout, which essentially means that at least 50% of the land needs to be maintained as open space, and the lots are allowed to be uh, instead of the standard 80,000 square feet with 200 feet of frontage, they may be 30,000 square feet with 100 feet of frontage. Um, again, as board members uh, may recall, this item was on your agenda at the last meeting. The applicant requested be tabled in, in advance of this meeting so they could respond to some staff comments. Um, let's see, in terms of um, layout, really the, the the major question staff has it has to do with the proposed 15-foot easement that sort of is on the perimeter of uh, the open space and lot three, I believe it is, just really wanting to better understand the intent and purposes around that and, and, um, and have some discussion around that as well. Um, outside of that, <clears throat> I guess we had one other question. And, it's really a, an academic point, but just for point of clarity in the record, I uh, just need to understand if, as, as board members may recall, a in the RF, there are certain triggers that require a conservation subdivision design, such as having an acre more of wetlands on site um, if you're disturbing 4,300 square feet of wetlands, and there's three or four other triggers. Um, and it, it wasn't clear in the submission if the applicant uh, approached any of those triggers, or if this is an elective subdivision, the applicant's narrative refers to it as an elective subdivision. Either way, as I said, it's really sort of a, an academic exercise, because if it's an elective subdivision, they're only required to have 40% of open space. If it's required, they're required to have 50% of open space. They're proposing about 60% of open space. Again, I'm only really flagging the question for a point of clarity in the record. Um, but uh, So outside of that, I think, uh, that's what I have for the board at this time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chase, and good evening. Good evening. My name is Matthew Eck from Sebago Technics, and I'm representing Richard Waterhouse on this subdivision. Uh, Richard is here this evening if you have any direct questions for him as well. Um, some of you may remember um, this was uh, presented to the planning board several years ago, uh, I believe in 2006, um, for a large subdivision. And there's certainly a potential for a future subdivision out back. Um, but we're basically looking at conserving the area, and we did look at it originally as being an elective subdivision. And uh, our last submission uh, did have a little bit smaller um, area shown, and um, we'd, we'd done some new calculations based on the comments um, by the planning staff. And it, it may be a required subdivision, or a required conservation subdivision now rather than elective. Uh, we first looked at <coughs> being an elective, um, but certainly we're well above the standards for required as well. Um, so we can certainly change that on, on any language that does show it as elective um, in, in any future application. Um, basically, this is a 74-acre parcel overall. Uh, we're looking at basically dividing a nine and two-thirds acre uh, parcel off and breaking it into three lots. Uh, Mr. Waterhouse lives in the, in the house uh, in the middle lot on the subdivision, lot two. Um, is basically looking at dividing off and creating two new residential uh, house lots. Um, in the previous subdivision plan, uh, or the, the plan from several years ago, is basically a, a road design coming up here and looping back and accessing property over here um, with a secondary road going up that way. Um, to meet the town's design standards for a road, uh, it's a 50-foot right-of-way requirement. But with the road standards, it is very common to have a 15-foot easement on both sides of proposed roads um, for any grading that needs to extend beyond it, um, or a utility such as transformers, not knowing where uh, CMP would need the transformers and such. Uh, we basically just are reserving that 15-foot strip for any needed um, 
grading or utility such as a transformer. Um, There's a subdivision later this evening that you'll be seeing, South Coast Community Church. I was just looking at that. Um, that has 15 foot easements on both sides of its proposed road. Uh, although we're not proposing any road as part of this one, we did want to reserve that right for the future. Um, so it is um, encompassing uh, lot three, uh, as well as the open space, which is going to be commonly owned between all three. Um, certainly it's easier to reserve that right now than after you sell the lot. Um, so when the lots are sold, they're reserving that right now um, for that possible future road. Uh, that was one of the, the comments they had. So uh, I think that um, I think that Jay did a pretty good uh, introduction to the subdivision, and we're certainly here to answer any questions that the board may have. Okay. Uh, it is our policy that when an item comes in front of us, uh, as this one has, that we offer an opportunity for public comment. If there's anybody here from the public who would like to make comment on what they've heard or seen so far this evening, we would welcome them to approach the podium. Please state their name and address for the record, and we ask that you try to keep your comments to five minutes or less if possible. If anybody would like to make a public comment, please do so at this time. Seeing none, I will turn it over to the board and ask Ms. Oglis if she'd like to kick it off. <laughs> Okay. It would be so helpful to me if I had a map that showed me where on Beach Ridge Road this piece of property. Uh, Show me. Ah, there it is. Cranberry, oh, Cranberry Pine. Down on the left. Yep. So uh, looking at the map that was just pointed out to me, does Mr. Waterhouse essentially own... I'm trying to figure out... 74 acres. 74 acres beyond what we're seeing here. Uh, no, the remaining land will be about 65 acres. Okay. It is highlighted in the darker line, his entire yeah. parcel. Oh, parcel. This is the parcel. Okay. The darker line in the location map area. Okay. Is the overall parcel. Yeah. I would ask that if you leave the podium, would you please grab the hand mic <laughs> for the benefit of all of those who are watching from home. Okay. Yes, Thank you. So many people do. Okay. Um, do we know, that it, as, as um, Jay said, it doesn't much matter, but is this a choice that you, I'm just curious, is this just... It was our original choice to do a conservation subdivision to try and preserve the area around the stream. Um, okay. It may have triggered um, to be a requirement, but we're well above. Um, there's a 40% requirement for elective, 50% yeah. requirement for required. We're at 61%. Right. I was just curious. Okay, so the open space is anything above the yellow, yep. including all of the setbacks around the river, around the stream. All of the, yeah, all of yep. the green is, is wetland, the stream is blue, and then the whole area is open space. And this is going to be owned by the Homeowners Association. It's going to be owned by the three in common, yes. Yeah. And there will be an association, right, to manage that yes, open with, space? Yes, with, with restrictions, certainly, in their conservation easement. Okay. I don't have anything right now. That will take care of me for the moment. Thank you, Susan. Mr. Manzo. Uh, yeah, on the map, it says easements. What are those easements? Up? They're... Each of the individual lots will have their own easement within the open space um, so that they can go put a, a picnic table or a chair to sit and watch the, the stream go by or have a picnic. Um, that's part of the conservation easement that's listed in there. I believe they also listed having a hammock. Okay. And again, for, for my thinking, which of the three lots does uh, Mr. Waterhouse now live on? Or the uh, middle lot, lot the, two. The, the number two? Yeah. The, the house is shaded in gray on this plan up here. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have for right now. I Thanks, Ron. More. Appreciate it. John? Uh, I'm okay, except for uh, we asked last time for some elevation so we could see the drainage towards the, these other lots, which we didn't have here. 
Um, we do have, we're showing the contours. Um, it's up to the individual property owners as to where they're placing house lots. So I'm not sure where, you know, they may build back here, up front, so we can't do any proposed drainage. Um, you know, any proposed drainage will certainly be reviewed by code enforcement um, and have to follow the standards. Uh, we're not proposing any change in grades at all within the open space. Uh, it would all be done within the individual lots themselves. Okay. I think to your your point, Mr. Dupont, uh, um, our our peer reviewer Woodner and Kern was also looking for a little bit more, recognizing that you know there is going to be quite a bit of uh, uh, vegetative buffer remaining, um, but that we do need some type of indication in the mm -hmm. record. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so again, I think you know should the board be. This is a subdivision uh, for preliminary review at this time, depending on how the board comfort level on that item is. Um, we can sort of consider it. Consider one of our last cases, it, it barely passed because we we're concerned on drainage to the neighbors. <coughs> That's our concern that this project doesn't affect the abutters. So we really want to see that and maybe indicate where they're going to put the houses. There. They could put the house anywhere in the white area shown up here. There's um, the building envelope. Basically, Mr. Waterhouse could build somewhere else within the white if he wanted to put it, something else in. But anywhere within the white, there would be allowed construction. Um, being fair-sized lots still, not knowing where any potential owners are going, um, the lots are sloping back towards uh, the stream. There's a, a very large buffer area along the stream between the 75 foot setback and the property lines even. Um, so there's certainly a buffer area between the proposed the proposed two house developments and the stream. That's all within the open space. So there's a considerable buffer area. Okay. And it is holding back towards the stream, not towards an abutter. You'd like to see that on the next submission? Okay. It Still on the same topic. <coughs> I've never heard of not having anything said until the lot is sold and the house lot, the the, the, the uh, <coughs> site is chosen, and then we do. Yeah, I don't know. It, you know, to to you know, I'm not a civil engineer, so I don't want to speak for what our peer reviewer would look for. And certainly, if there's questions, I would put the applicant's engineer directly in touch with our peer reviewer. But I do think, and just in my conversations with a peer reviewer, it is really just having the applicant articulate for the record the type of discussion we just had. Because stormwater, again, these are large lots. There is a large undisturbed uh, buffer area that's going to remain between the edge of the lots and the stream. Um, but that evidence wasn't described in writing in the record. So, okay. so to your point, I, you know, we don't envision this being a full, you know, uh, Stormwater analysis that we might see where there's a pipe outlet per se, right. <laughs> but it so is. This, this is pl just a preliminary presentation, preliminary review. We're not, we're not going for for preliminary approval tonight, are we? You could do the. You know, there's a two-step process for subdivisions. There's preliminary review and right. approval, and final review and approval. Depending on the board's comfort level, you could provide preliminary tonight okay. with condition, or you could no, I ask for more evidence. It's Thank you. At the discretion of the board, certainly. John, you all set? Yes, sorry. Corey? Thank you. Um, the quality of my plan copy here is not great, and I can't really see yours that, that clearly from here in terms of some of the details. Could you just confirm for me that as, that as it's designed right now, the conservation subdivision plan doesn't have any wetlands on, pro on private property? There are wetlands on private property. Um, you can see they're highlighted in green right here. There's a buffer area around them. And um, there's a, a culvert here that um, has, has gone up over the years, I believe, that's created a small wetland area out front here. You can see that they we're proposing a buffer area around that as well. So we're not proposing to impact any wetlands as part of this development. Okay. I appreciate that you don't plan to impact or disturb it per se, but it, generally speaking, the board has always tried to avoid having uh, wetland on private property at all because it, things happen over time. And um, I'm feeling our chairman might have a little more to add on that. Um, we get to him. But I, and I know we're preliminary, but that seems 
you know, at this stage, like kind of a mm -hmm. potential threshold question. It is somewhat limited. I mean, obviously, this one needs to remain on private property, and we we are somewhat limited here, but we are providing a 25 foot buffer, uh, no build, no disturb buffer within that zone. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what what you could do about that one in the front. It's a tough one. Um, this is a question maybe more for staff or potentially peer review. Um, have there been any potential concerns or questions raised around uh, sight lines for pulling out of any of these properties onto what sort of a, uh, not a main road, but it's a feeder type road. It's not like some of the other, kind of similar to one of the projects yep. we saw yep. last time where <coughs> you have people going directly onto a <coughs> travel road as opposed to having a subdivision that's kind of set back from the road. No, nope, this, kind of, uh, this one is kind of ideally positioned. It's on the, you can see there's a slight curve to the road. We're on the outside of the curve. So when you're pulling up to the outside of the curve, you can see both ways down the curve much better. It's got significant sight distance. Okay. There haven't been any issues raised okay. by Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, I think that's all I've got right now. All right. Thank, thank you. Nick? I think going back to the wetlands issue, I think, I mean, Mr. Waterhouse has clearly lived on a piece of private property with wetlands on it for a number of years, I assume. Um, so what I would recommend, just as in a suggestion, I guess, would be maybe to have those wetlands remain as part of his property, knowing full well that they've been on his property for the time being. Is there a way to make sure that a new owner doesn't come in and have wetlands on their new property because you're creating a new lot? And that kind of will go hand in hand with my next question, which is, is there any specific reason why the first lot is shaped the way it is? Um, they're required to have a 100-foot frontage um, all the way back to the setback. We're providing a building envelope out front that certainly is above 100 feet. It's 101 feet um, of frontage. Uh, and then it's narrowing up due to a septic system that exists on Mr. Waterhouse's property um, that's serving his existing house. So rather than relocate the septic system, um, you know, we project that someone would build in the wider area out front or the wider area out back. Um, I wouldn't assume that someone would build in the middle, but someone could if they chose to, um, but presuming that they would build in the front area or the back area of the property. We're in uh, RF? Yeah. Correct. Septic, 25 feet setback from a property line? Is that... That's probably not a fair question to ask you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that there's a setback requirement for septics. I, I'm not entirely certain of that. I know there's sep you know, uh, separation distance between wells and the like, but I don't know that there's property line setbacks uh, necessarily for septics or leach fields. Uh, I ask because I know there is one in Biddeford that I'm dealing with currently. Okay. So, um, but it get, goes to the point of that being so narrow, but I guess you're saying that the, how far away is that septic tank on the private property located away from that property line? Uh, it's Where approximately it? 25 feet. There's a 15-foot setback, and it's approximately 10 feet beyond that. So 25 feet away from the line? Approximately. Yep. And do you know what the distance between the shortest two points there is um, on that watt one? I'm going to call it the belt. Between yeah. this yeah. area? Yeah, do uh, you know what that distance is? I'm not sure of that distance. I can scale it for you as well. Because it, it appears to be narrower than the frontage, and the frontage is 93 feet. So I just kind of wanted to get an idea of how um, how much that narrows. Approximately 65 feet scaled. Okay. So if you had a house, I'm going to ask you to do some math real quick. Sorry about this. Um, Okay, you've got 130 feet, so you get about 200 feet to the belt. Is that what you're saying? With my my quick estimate here, you get a 70 foot a turn, 130 foot. What is it, 130 feet? This line here, the lot line between one and two, up to that, the you know the narrowest point is what I'm trying to calculate. If I, what I'm saying is that you have a house on the front side, all right, and then you're going to put it in a septic system and a well. I imagine there's no public water out there. No public. Water. Yeah. So you have a septic system and well, and you're going to have a bunch of setbacks for that. Are you going to be able to get a house lot into the front of that? Certainly. I mean, the lot is, uh, is several hundred feet deep. You can put the well near the back. Um, you can put the septic behind the house. I mean, there's certainly ample room. It's a, it's 
it's a reasonable size lot. I think it's probably going to end up being a homeowner choice, not necessarily a logistical choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it really is a homeowner's choice as to whether they want to build out front or out back. Both are, are nice building envelopes. Okay. I think that's, that's all I have. All right, thank you. <coughs> Once again, I'm seeing things that I guess I'm not sure I've seen before. Yeah, quite some <laughs> there's, nice. there's some really unique things that are happening here that um, just kind of beg to have a few questions asked. Um, the first one has to do with the 15-foot easements, I'll call it on the north side and on the east side, and I understand your description of the width of the road and the ability to maybe have that 15-foot buffer, but given the amount of property that you have, why would you create an easement and not just move the property line by 15 feet and not have to have an easement? Glad you asked that. Um, if you do that and you construct a road in the future, then who owns the 15-foot strip? So that becomes an issue for the future. We're trying, you know, we're trying as planners, um, as you're the planning board and planning staff, to plan ahead. Um, it's very common in Scarborough to have the 15-foot easements on both sides of the road. So if we put the 15-foot easement in this description so that we can reserve that right for future use, we can put the 50-foot right of way adjacent to it, which then could be conveyed to a homeowner's association or the town and the easement could be conveyed to either the homeowners association or the town or the latter subdivision if it is ever developed. It, it may not be developed. It may be conveyed to someone else. It may be whatever. We're just trying to reserve that right in case there's a subdivision in the future. It could be 10 years or 100 years away. Okay. We just want to reserve that right. You can't go back and try and get a 15-foot easement from someone in the future. Okay. And if you do bump that back 15 feet, then it becomes an issue as to who would own that 15-foot strip, because that would be a lot in between the right-of-way and this subdivision. Just why, why would it be a lot? Why wouldn't it just be part of the property that the 50-foot is part of? Then it would be an 80-foot wide right-of-way which the town may or may not wish to accept in the future. The standard is a 50-foot right-of-way with 15-foot easements on both sides. It's actually typically 10-foot easements on each side. Okay. And I believe so that the, the space that the, the sliver of remaining land, I believe it's 75 feet wide without the easement. Is that <coughs> I think I, when I scaled that off, is that what you left? Uh, the, the strip of land on the... Okay. Yep, coming off of uh, West Beechridge Road. When it I scaled it off, I think it was around 75 to 80 it feet. It is roughly that width, so, which I would mean, allow for 15 feet on one side. Right. Typically, we have a 50-foot wide right away with 10-foot right. wide easements on either side, which is 70 feet. Um, so I think that's where the town engineer and planning staff's comments both suggested we d we're not really seeing the need for this additional 15 feet where where the, w the, the neck, if you will, that's left coming off West Beechridge exceeds 75 feet, where we typically would look for only 70. You're already exceeding what we would typically need, so. We're also looking at the turning radiuses to get in, as we're showing a radius on mm -hmm. this corner of this lot. We do have an existing fire tank on this side, so we're trying to avoid encroaching into that area for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so this this basically this is the design of the previous road and we also do have a stream to cross in the future if it is ever developed that stream crossing will also need some extended width um, to get over that you know reasonable depth um, as you're crossing that and that is why we were looking at it the previous subdivision showed 15 mm -hmm. feet on each side that's why we went with the 15 now just to accommodate the grading that that subdivision showed on it. All set? Sure. All right. <clears throat> so my second question regarding easements is the three easements that you have near the stream. Um, 
and I appreciate the fact that you've got the stream buffer going on, but the easements, as I think you mentioned earlier, were they're, they're quite a bit bigger. Um, so who does the easement go to? Okay, basically the entire open space is owned in common by the three owners. Each owner has its own easement so that they can put their picnic table or chair in their area. They can't go into the other areas okay. and, and such. Um, there's a path proposed on this side to allow access for all the owners on the opposite side of the stream, as well as any future development would have a path easement going through the open space. Um, somewhat recreational. Um, that's that's the purpose of that. So we have a restricted easement that's basically planned for a family. Yes. Correct. Yes. Each piece of property would have its own <coughs> restricted easement within the open space just for their family. So I guess my question would be, would that be considered open space? No. And, and should that be part of the open space calculation if only yep. one family has access to it? Yeah, the, I agree this is unique. Um, when I looked at the zoning ordinance, there's nothing in the ordinance that talks about who needs to have access to the open space. As the applicant said, there's the, ownership, the, the type of activities within the open space needs to be established. Um, and they're meeting one of those. It's to be uh, conserved natural areas to be undeveloped. So they're sort of meeting that threshold. Then the next statement in the, uh, in the language is about who owns the open space. It needs to either be owned in common by the homeowner association or go to a third party land trust or something to that effect to hold the, conser to hold the conservation. But the language does not say anything about who can or cannot access that open space. So. Um, I looked at this, I thought it was unique as well. I sort of poured over the language, but I didn't see anything in my view of it that um, was contrary to what the ordinance provisions allow. Uh, but certainly, we basically showed that uh, after discussing it with Jay. I'm sorry? We, had, we basically showed it that way after discussing it with Jay to allow, you know, basically, okay. if someone builds a home right here, you know, they may not want someone right here, putting there a picnic table or something. So we tried to restrict the area right behind theirs. They're all restricted to the open space requirements. But if they want to put a picnic table or something in that small area, they could do that. Mr. Chair, that was my opening question, and I'm still just confused <laughs> now about Well, I understand what he's saying. It's just that's very different from anything I've seen in nine years. So. Susan? I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. I agree with Susan. It, has, it never has been done. It doesn't mean that I don't like anything that hasn't been done. But this is owned this is owned by three people. If you can't get three people to decide where they're going to put a picnic table without starting a civil war, you got a problem. I think that by putting an easement on here for each lot is I can just, you know, I don't want to spend a whole lot more time on this. I'm not ready to give it preliminary approval, I'll tell you that. I mean, I want to get the engineers involved in this and see what they're going to come up with. But it just seems like it's a setting a precedent that could be three people with this much space. <coughs> it might work. I mean, who cares? What, what are we gaining? I don't understand what we're gaining here. We've got, we got, we got open space all over the town of Scarborough, thousands of acres of it probably that are owned in common by people. And it's, this has never been, people just somehow or another share their open space. <laughs> they don't put easements in the middle of open space. I, I just don't, I, I would like it to be looked at again. I don't want to make that decision. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with it. And as a result, I'm not comfortable with voting, I did not vote, on, on getting preliminary approval to this. There's too many questions about it. I understand. Oh, I'll let go some of the sentiments here, which is by restricting it, you're essentially making it private property you without are. the ownership value to it. That's the way which it's, is, it's right. skirts the way it's skirting our conservation. You know, the purpose of a conservation subdivision, the intent of it is being violated, in my opinion. It's, 
to me it's, it's an end I mean, it, yeah. by doing that, you're restricting access. Right. But for anybody else to access that open space, and I'd kind of like to get uh, mm -hmm. some kind of a. The, the one thing I'll, and I can appreciate the board's position on it, because this is one that I struggled with as well, but I'll just point out, and, and you know, if I think where I heard where the chair was going, wanting to have a, a, a second legal review of this, that's perfectly at the board's discretion. Um, but I will point out that there's different provisions in Section 7A that speak to the use of open space. One of them that the applicant's proposing is for the conservation of wetlands, forestlands, meadows, and other natural areas. And it needs to meet the following. I sort of spoke through those about. Then the next one is about open spaces to accommodate passive and active recreational space. Um, and so I think there are, there are instances, and most of the instances that we do see, the open space is um, open to all the property owners, um, but maybe it's, yeah, it's but between, it is between, uh, maybe there's a distinction between open and common. Yep. Well, I mean, I, and, uh, well, that I guess, might help. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I, that distinction is one, and the other question that I have is, given the intent of what the easement is all about, should it really be part of the open space calculation? We didn't get an answer to that. I, that's a good question. Because if you don't put if it's deemed that it's not part of the open space calculation, that changes everything. That's a big chunk of property that's going under easement. I mean, it's half of the open space. I really can certainly ask for a legal opinion if uh, the yeah. board is so inclined. I just please. I, I, that was my opening question. It's very unusual, and I guess I just want to make sure that we're not. Um, Starting something that we wish we hadn't, mm -hmm. or shouldn't have. Fair enough. Um, and I guess my final comment, uh, consistent with what Mr. McGee was saying, um, I would really like to see the, and I, I believe that uh, Mr. Fellows made a comment as well. But again, given the amount of property that we have here, I would love to see the wetland area that is considered, I think, part of lot number one to be part of the open space and not part of the private lot. I, I understand we've got a situation on lot number two. It's been there for years and years and years. But again, um, we work very, very hard to try to keep wetland areas off private property <coughs> because they disappear. And while I know that other towns and communities think it's fine, uh, we prefer that that's not the case. And this is a situation where I don't think that it has impact on the saleability of the land or anything else. So, that, you know, it certainly doesn't impact the building space or the ability to get to the building space. So I think that, that can easily be made part of the open space and taken off private property. And I would like to see it that way. I certainly see that we could do that. It would alter the shape of that lot, certainly. Okay. I agree. And that's my last comment. And I am also in the same position, I guess, in terms of any kind of a, approval this evening. I really do want to try to get a, a, a legal um, uh, response to the question because I don't want to approve something that potentially could change the open space sizing. Thank you. It may not have any impact on it whatsoever, and we may see this again in the future. That it is what it is, but I just want to feel a little more comfortable with it. I think it's legitimate to do that. I mean, you've been on the board for nine years. I was on it forever. You know, you'd never see anything, and then all of a sudden it pops up. It's not that it's a bad thing that it's coming up, but I think that it, that we just need to make sure that we didn't make a decision that ultimately is going to create a problem. Yeah, I, so let's just take a little more time and look at it. This is, this is a unique yeah. a unique one. Very. So I just want to make sure we get it right. Any other comments from the board? Any other questions from the applicant? 
Um, just uh, on page two of my application letter, I, I do have a statement on there regarding drainage from my engineer. Uh, the subdivision proposed no infrastructure construction, only the development of two house plots. The overall drainage plan consists of a grading the site away from the foundation of the two lots as the existing topography slopes away from West Beach Ridge Road. Vegetated swales will intercept the runoff from the front yard and direct it around the sides of the homes to disperse it via sheet flow through the retained wood open space. Um, I'm not sure really what else you want for engineering. We can't design the, lot, the individual lots um, not knowing where they're going to place the homes. Um, so you, you all had questions on the grading, but uh, we are providing a significant buffer on the back of the lots. Uh, it is sloping back towards the stream. And without designing the individual house lots and, and restricting them to be as we're showing on this subdivision plan, uh, I, I think that really needs to go before the uh, building inspector when they're looking at the individual yeah, I guess house that, placement. That's my question for staff, if you will. If when the subdevelopment is approved and a building permit is being sought, does code enforcement look at any kind of stormwater runoff that's... Yeah, I think I would, uh, not to get into what our uh, code enforcement officer does or doesn't look to at building permit time, what I'd like to sort of focus on is the, the comment from Woodard and Kern, our peer review civil engineers, when they reviewed the applicant's submission, including the statement that was provided. Um, Woodard and Kern, uh, basically left with the remaining question of that the applicant should know any stormwater buffer areas on the plan along with associated clearing restrictions. The applicant should clarify how the buffer will be in identified and delineated in the field. So I guess as, with, as is customary with most our, with all our applications, when the applicant uh, does resubmit for the board, it will, we will have, we would expect a response to that comment. And if they have <laughs> questions in pre preparation of that comment, I'd certainly gladly set up a uh, meeting between the applicant's engineer and our civil engineer so that there isn't confusion moving forward. Um, but I think it's a um, fairly standard procedure. Okay. I think that if the point. peer review engineer and the town engineer and the applicant's engineer are in agreement. Okay, that's, that's good. Fine. Thanks. Okay. Anything else from the board? All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Our next item this evening is Waterstone Scarborough LLC request a site plan review for development of Lot 7 at Scarborough Gallery Subdivision. Mr. Chase. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an application that the board uh, may recall have uh, seen through sort of the winter months and into spring, maybe even into early summer. Um, the board spent a meeting or two or three looking at the specific site elements of this application. And then uh, I think the last meeting we had spent a lot of time really on the architecture. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm sorry, let me back up for just a moment. Uh, the lot in question is the last lot, last undeveloped lot in the Scarborough Gallery subdivision. This lot abuts uh, Walmart, is across the street from Lowe's. Um, board members will recall we did a, uh, the board provided a sort of plim or sketch plan review when they were looking to do preloading uh, for the site. Um, and, um, and folks, from the community are probably familiar with the site at this point, given the uh, excess materials that have been on the site. So they're probably wondering what's going on. Um, so as I said, uh, the board really reviewed the details of this back in the spring and summer, ostensibly got to the point where you were very comfortable with the site plan. Um, again, we can go over the details as the, as the board sees fit. Um, um, but the applicant wanted to take some time since the planning board, uh, one, they were still working through their DEP permitting process, and since planning board approvals only last for a year, I think they wanted to be sure that their preloading was far enough along prior to coming to get final approval. Um, so we provided you um, some staff comments 
As I said, for a project this size, our staff comments are pretty minimal because we had worked through a lot of the issues over the last three, four, or five times we had seen this. Really the two outstanding items as staff recalled it when we last saw this were there were questions with regards to the architecture on the, I guess I'll call it the east face, the, the, uh, <coughs> the wall facing Gallery Boulevard and how that met the design standards uh, in terms of uh, 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 storefronts facing uh, public streets. Um, and the other outstanding question was in terms of cart corrals. Outside of that, uh, I believe we have extensively reviewed all the other site elements. Um, and with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Ms. St. Clair, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight with Frank Quigley, who's just sitting down, uh, who is the owner's rep for the applicant. And also I have Tim Tobin here, who is the architect. He's here to talk to you folks about uh, the plans that you do see before you that have uh, been prepared in, in order to address the comments that were last received from you folks. Uh, as Jay mentioned, we were last before you folks actually in June. June 2nd uh, was our meeting with you at the last presentation. And that presentation really focused on architecture. And the board did have a couple of comments, a couple of additional items that uh, they asked that we provide. And we're here tonight to speak about those items as well. But before Tim gets up and does his presentation, I did want to sort of bring you all up to speed as to where we are uh, in the process. As Jay had mentioned, in the interim since uh, meeting with you folks, we have gone through the uh, amended site location review process with the Department of Environmental Protection. Our permit has been received. Uh, it's been submitted to uh, the town, so it is, is a complete uh, uh, process with regard to that. In that process, basically the updates that were provided and they're on your plans uh, that you have before you were really focused around some additional erosion sediment control measures. Uh, for the site, the design didn't change, the layout didn't change. We still have uh, the same configuration of the site and the buildings that was presented to you folks uh, back in May of this year. And so we just wanted to kind of give you a brief you know, update as to what the changes were with the DEP. Uh, we are, uh, as you know, the site is settling still. We are in the active preload process. That is uh, moving forward uh, as anticipated. And we are looking forward to be able, being able to start construction, hopefully, uh, early in 2015. And so closely monitoring that uh, effort, our, our geotechnical consultants as part of the team, SW Cole. SW Cole has reviewed our plans. And based on the monitoring results, they have made a couple of recommendations with regard to some of the details, uh, one of which is the pavement buildup, the thickness of the pavement in the standard duty pavement sections, and a couple of other items of note with regard to trenching. Nothing that affects the layout, nothing that affects the grading design or anything like that, um, but there were a couple of comments that uh, we have received from them that we'll be integrating into our details for construction. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Tim Tobin, who will talk to you a little bit about the architecture, and then I'll circle back. Hi, my name is Tim Tobin with Phase Zero Design. Uh, in the hearing in June 2nd, um, we talked about... If you're going to get grab the hand mic and... One. Yep, that would be great. Thanks. Um, we talked about uh, the building architecture, and um, essentially um, the board uh, was focusing on, um, as was stated, is, is this elevation or the east elevation, east-facing elevation along the Gallery Boulevard. And uh, what they felt was sort of um, some missing detail from this end of the building. Uh, we've gone back um, and taken a look at that, and we added uh, some of the piers that occur here along this area. It is um, the end of one of the largest doors in the area, and uh, and this is a loading bay. And we also carried some of the some additional landscaping down, lower landscaping. But on the wall, we've put um, this uh, product it's called uh, Echo Mesh, if you will. It attaches to the block and allows for vines to grow up and sort of soften the impact of the masonry along this um, elevation here. Um, we had 
previously talked about the storefront side along the Gallery Boulevard, and then on the side that faces the Walmart parking lot, we added a few um, piers as well along with lower planting. The other comment that was within the, um, the, the board's uh, commentary that we received was the uh, request for um, a cart corral, if you will, and uh, we looked at what they had at Walmart and Lowe's, which is essentially the pipe rail uh, things that they stick out in the parking lot and didn't really, um, Waterstone didn't like that too much. So what we came up with was a design where we're grabbing the width of two parking spaces here, and we're going to bring out the curbing and landscape from these landscaped islands out and essentially create a landscaped island that will hide those metal car corrals that will be contained inside as a screen, if you will, rather than try to just stick this out in a parking lot somewhere. And um, that is essentially um, where we left it. We felt, uh, or at least the reaction we got from the board last time was relatively favorable. If anyone would like these, I have extra copies. Would anybody else like one? No, I'll just pass it down. Landscaping that you see in there is the same landscaping that we are using on the islands and elsewhere on the site. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can we ask a question of him while he's up there or do we want to wait until it's all? Uh, why don't we let them complete their presentation? I'm, I'm pretty much done. Uh, if, you, if there's anything else you'd like me to address, I could certainly do it. But. Okay. Um, Nancy, you're all done? Well, I just wanted to add something. Ooh, sorry. As I, it's, it's probably well understood. We're, we were hoping that uh, the board would feel, com feel comfortable in granting approval tonight. Um, we'd like to, you know, be able to have this approval. Uh, we do have everything from the permitting standpoint in place, and we'd like to be able to reach some certain thresholds with regard to contractual agreements that the applicant has in order to uh, be able to move forward, recognizing that construction will start in the spring, but we would respectfully ask that uh, the board consider granting approval tonight. So that's what I just wanted to add. Let's see what the wishes of the board is. Start with so she had to. She would like to go. Go ahead. No, no, I just want. No, I don't have to go right now. But no, please. Uh, okay. Um, the corral that we've just passed down. Yes. Okay. It's really kind of hard to figure out from this. What is it? This is a nice planting. Planting. Which are mimicking what's going to be on the aisle on the. Um, hmm. I don't know if it's too this time of night. The, 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 uh, the vertical islands or yeah. the So what is what is behind here? Is this a metal a metal bar? Yeah, if you've been into Walmart right. or the, or the um, Lowe's parking lot. So this lot, is, how many how many corrals are gonna be behind here? Uh there'll be two rows. Two rows of two vertical rows you Okay. Have and there'll be one of these on each of the landscaping <laughs> Aisles. There are there are one, two, there are three. One here. Yeah. Here. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. I like it. Okay. I'm not trying to be difficult, but that doesn't seem like very many corrals for the parking lot that big. Well, in tenant A, um, I can't tell you the name. Of no, of course you can't. <laughs> I won't, and I wouldn't ask you. But it's a national furniture retailer. Oh, they typically don't, they all don't. the sales. Uh, they don't typically have shopping carts. You <laughs> pick up anything that you buy or it's delivered. Um, Retail B is a national pet supply chain, and typically 
um, you use a card inside the store. They typically don't go out except for bigger things, so there might be a few. I got you. Okay. As long as you're And you then Retail D, mm -hmm. uh, they do have cards, but they don't have very many of them. So we just wanted to address okay. the need for cards, but we don't think there's going to be very many. Well, you answered them. my question because I was thinking this isn't very many, and the answer is we don't need very many. So it would be tantamount to two. Uh, and the thing is, that it's, it's just corrals, so if somebody changes and they need to add corrals, you can add corrals, right? Okay. Um, looking at the landscaping, um, not landscaping, the elevations, exterior elevations, could you put that one back up again? Sure. So are you telling me that the far right on the west side Okay, west elevation, far right, is going to end up with the same sort of um, metal grid with vine plantings that I see on the east side? We weren't planning that as that faces the, the Walmart parking lot, and there's actually a substantial um, landscape buffer between the two lots, okay. if you will. But since the opposite, the east end faces Gallery Boulevard, which and it's a high visibility area. I understand. I understand. I would like to just make a note that, to staff. Um, I would like to have personally a, a landscaping um, sheet that I can actually read when they, when they come like this. You know, this is a m small version. I'm the landscape lady. I can't make head and tail out of this because it's just crammed together, and I don't have any problems with it. I've seen it before. It's okay. This is just the staff. I don't know whether anybody else wants it, but would you make a note that when my packet goes out, I would like to have full landscape plan. Other than that, I don't have any real problems with this. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Okay. You're going to refresh my memory. It has been a little while. Um, <clears throat> was there always an entrance on the east face of this building? Mm-hmm. There was? Okay. That was it. It's clarified. <laughs> <laughs> We've proved to have a terrible memory. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Fellows. Yeah, I don't have any further questions. I appreciate that you uh, added some interest to that facade on the east side, east facing side, and um, not a whole lot to add at this point. All right. Thank you. Mr. DuPont. I'm here. Nothing to say. Lights improvements. Appreciate it. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Mr. Mazur. No comment other than look forward to it. I do have a question for Nelson. Um, the far right, the, the um, front ele front north elevation, okay, there are, <coughs> the, flat, the, the building D is two entrances. You've got You've got four buildings there, A and D, and you've got five. This is that's building, what I'm looking for. National retail with two okay, that's what I needed to know. Two separate, one building. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, once again, this is the night for new things to go on, but the most interesting car corrals that I've, I've seen. I've ever seen. Especially and given kind of like a. will be there is that tubular frame park corral. Right. We just didn't want to look at those in the parking lot. Well, we I, don't want to look I appreciate that. No, I'm, I'm saying I, I do fully appreciate that. And I, you know, yes. I give you a big thumbs up for being creative on a different way to approach a common eyesore. So I think that's really kind yes. of an interesting way to do it. And I'm sure that. Uh, Members of this board may be suggesting something similar to that as we move on. <laughs> so, yeah, you, <laughs> you might have started that's something. That's going uh, uh, to be my next comment. Either. You give us an idea for the rest of the retailers, and they're going to hate us for it. Yeah. Well, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> what, remember the name so that yeah, we no. can. Yeah. Remember the name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second comment is thank you for the upgrade to that, um, that east side. It, I think that's. Much better. significantly better than what we were seeing before, and you know now I think that approach coming in off Muzzy Road will make uh, it'll be a lot nicer. So we appreciate that you listened and did something to improve that. So 
Uh, if people are wondering why we really don't have many questions, we vetted this pretty well um, <laughs> over over the uh, the last year or so that that it's been coming in front of us. Although we haven't seen this in June second, it was pretty well set to go, with the exception of DEP and a couple of little minor items. Then, so uh, if people are wondering why we're kind of zipping through this, that would be the reason. So. <clears throat> I would like to move to approve the application of Waterstone Scarborough LLC under Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, and Chapter 405B, the Town of Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance, with the following findings and conditions. Findings. Waterstone Scarborough LLC proposes to develop property identified as Lot 7 of the Scarborough Gallery Subdivision. The property is located within the B2 zone, uh, Zoning District with frontage along Gallery Boulevard. The applicant proposes to develop a multi-building site consisting of approximately 106,362 square feet of multi-tenant anchor building with two satellite buildings, which are currently envisioned to include an approximately 4,872 square foot restaurant and retail space in approximately 2,248 square foot building. The development is proposed to occur in two phases. Phase one, consisting of the anchor tenant and all associated site elements. Phase two, consisting of the building details of the two small satellite buildings and their immediate surroundings. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. The Planning Board has reviewed the architectural details of the main anchor tenant building and finds that the building architecture and site layout are in compliance with the provisions of the design standards for Scarborough's commercial districts. Conditions. Prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the peer review fees. Prior to the issuance of, a, of the building permit, the applicant shall provide planning staff with a revised plan set to identify the location of the car corrals and finalize details of the bus shelter pad. Prior to the issuance of building permit, the applicant must submit a letter of approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District to the Planning Department. A pre-construction meeting is required before start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and his contractor, the utility company representatives if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordinating with the coordination with the senior planner. Prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. And development within phase two requires further planning board review and approval. Is there a second? I second. We have a second. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And I show that to be unanimous. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> you want this back? <clears throat> Our next item this evening, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to consider the site plan review application of the University of New England and Maine Army National Guard as part of the, part of the contract zoning procedure. Mr. Chase. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you just identified, this application is before the Board as step four of ten of the contract zoning process as laid out by our zoning ordinance. As planning board members will recall, uh, about six weeks ago or so, uh, board and council held a joint hearing uh, on the proposed uh, application for contract zone, at which time the council moved the item forward for planning board consideration. At this point in the review process, the planning board is charged with providing a preliminary review of the site plan uh, review elements ostensibly to ensure that the uh, proposal 
is in compliance with the site plan review ordinance. This application is different from the other nine or so contract zones that the town has previously approved in that um, in, other, in all other applications and instances, the applicant was ostensibly ready to move forward with their project nearly immediately. Um, with this project, as the applicant laid out in their uh, narrative to the board with this submission and in the discussion uh, with the council, is this project is some years away from development. Uh, board members will recall that this, uh, there's really two, uh, the applicant's proposing part of the development to occur in Saco. That's where the access for the project will come and where the, uh, with the proposed plan, where the readiness center would be, which the applicant um, is expecting funding to be, uh, hope, hopeful for funding and I think it's 2018. The, Scarborough property is where they've identified where the uh, vehicle maintenance shop would go. And at this time, the applicant, as, I'm, as I recall in their narrative, has stated they haven't yet secured the funding for. So really, it's an undefined time frame as to when this may be built. But what the applicant wants to do is get through the process to ensure that the use would be allowed in Scarborough so they can go forward to try to get funding through the Department of Defense. So it's a little different in that way, and, and I, I sort of give that background or preface for this reason, is that um, as staff thought through what the review process would look like, um, the direction that we've provided to date is that um, consideration be given to this in, in conceptual terms. Um, certainly, most projects we see that take years to develop, details change over a course of four to six or eight years whenever this project may be built in terms of stormwater or actual building design. Um, so I think conceptually we want to have an understanding of how those elements will be treated. Um, but in saying that, we do think that this part of the review process um, what the board can really dial into, if you will, with the applicant is um, it's really taking a look at the, at, at the details to ensure that uh, abutting property owners, uh, that any adverse impacts to abutting property uh, owners could be mitigated. Um, so in terms of that, you know, uh, the board may want to think about doing a more detailed review of the buffer, buffering and separation from the project from its residential neighbors um, in terms of vegetative landscaping, um, setting parameters for active development, if you will, sort of the edges of paving, uh, light, um, light intrusion or spillover, uh, ambient glow, if you will. Um, I think another critical component for the board to think about is uh, in terms of design standards. Do you want to make some form of recommendation to the council to consider through the contract zone process in terms of design standards? Um, this is in the RF zone, so um, if, uh, uh, if the board's interested in having some type of uh, architectural review implemented at the time of final review, the contract zone will be the place to ensure that occurs. Otherwise, the underlying zoning, the RF, doesn't require architectural review. Um, so those are the types of elements that we've touched on in our comments and really focused our specific details on. Um, and I'll just make note, um, really, um, you know, one of the, um, when we held the joint meeting, one of the comments that was raised was uh, from the a couple of the council members and I believe planning board members echoed a request to be sure that the application is reviewed by the Conservation Commission prior to going back to council for first reading. Um, and so that I've begun to work with the applicant and the Conservation Commission chairman to get this item on their November 10th agenda um, if that's the timing the applicant uh, seeks to move forward with. Uh, but that is a process we'll work forward towards to ensure that that occurs before it goes back to council for first reading. Um, so with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I did want to make note um, that we did receive one uh, letter, public comment letter from a Mr. Fairweather and that has been provided to board members and is uh, in, in the official record. Uh, board members will have also received 
We did ask Warden and Kern, our peer review civil engineer team, to weigh in, again, not on the details, because there isn't a detailed stormwater report, but just to weigh in on the general parameters. Are, are things heading in the right direction? You know, is, is there um, their general uh, uh, outline for the way they would handle stormwater makes sense? And um, so we have some commentary to that effect. But again, those are details that um, we can move forward through as time progresses should this um, should and if it gets uh, town council approval through the contract zone process. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to the applicant. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Alan Tebow. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Planning at the University of New England. And with me tonight are gentlemen from the National Guard. Uh, they are available to answer any specific questions about their program or how they would uh, work on the site if, uh, if I'm unable to answer that. We also have in the audience uh, uh, our civil engineer from Site Design Associates who can answer some of the more technical questions should we <coughs> have any of those that we need to address. Uh, it might seem a little strange that the University of New England is here presenting on behalf of the Maine Army National Guard. Uh, it's a long story and I'll try to keep it short. Some of you may have heard it at the joint meeting. But the University of New England owns two campuses, one in Biddeford, one in Portland. Our Portland campus wraps around the National Guard site in Portland. We have a small road that goes from our upper campus to our lower campus, making our lower campus difficult to develop. So many years ago, we approached the Guard and said, if you're ever interested in uh, divesting the property, we'd be interested in, in acquiring it. So not too long ago, they came to us and said, you know, our building is in need of significant repair. We've requested and applied for funding to replace this building. So they have two functions there. It's a readiness center and a field maintenance shop. So they have money allocated for the readiness center. The proposal that we're bringing forward actually en uh, encompasses both of those functions. The first phase would be the readiness center, and that would be located in, in, uh, in Saco. And the uh, FMS would be located in Scarborough. So what we're really addressing tonight is the FMS. The piece of land that we were able to find is, as shown here, this long linear piece. This is Route 1. This is the Saco scarborough line right here. And this is uh, Curves. If you know where Curves is located, that's right here on the Saco side of the line. The two parcels put together is the Scarborough piece here in green and the Saco piece here in yellow. Curves is located here. This is Route 1, and you can see the municipal line is here. East View Drive, which currently terminates right after Curves, is here. In this project, it would be extended down and then connected down to Don Marie Drive, and the Vesta Housing Development is located here. So you would actually have this as an access point in Saco, and then you could actually come down Don Marie Drive and exit a little bit further to the south as well. And that is a controlled intersection, so there's a light there. So they'd be able to um, get in and out of there with big trucks with relative ease. The current zoning on the uh, Scarborough piece is rural farmland. While the use of a uh, FMS or a field maintenance shop is very similar to accepted uses. This is specifically not included <coughs> or excluded, thus the need for the contract zone. It's very like a public works facility. It has service bays where they work on equipment and it has offices uh, associated with it as well as other support spaces to operate the facility, mechanical spaces, storage areas, etc. <coughs> The light green area is the total project site. And again, you can see the municipal line here going through Route 1, uh, Eastview Drive, Don Marie Drive, and then back up to Route 1 so you can see it in a little bit more context. The current uh, zoning on the, on the Saco piece, excuse me, is a contract zone that allows for this project to go forward. It is an accepted use in that. So the readiness center could be constructed in there going through site plan. These two projects are going together, so we have to make sure that this piece of property could accommodate the FMS before we can go forward with the Saco uh, 
uh, portion of the work. This is a copy of the existing conditions plan that was uh, submitted. And this is zoomed in a little bit more. Again, Route 1 is here. Eastview Drive is here. The municipal line east to west here. There is uh, an abutter with a residence here. That's Mr. Fairweather's property. This is a vacant lot next to it. Um, underneath this area here on the Saco side, there's uh, four or five different lots that are zoned for eating and drinking establishments for financial uh, institutions with drive throughs They could be business offices. Uh, a whole slew of different activities could happen there, municipal, quasi-public uh, uses as well. So the zoning there is, um, is a business district, essentially. On the lot, there is a stream that runs from the Saco side and through the middle of the lot and then drains back down to the uh, Saco Marsh estuary system. There is a resource protection zone on the back end of the property here. There is, some, uh, there is a, deer can a candidate deer wintering yard identified here from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Mapping. And then there is a resource protection zone uh, just off the property to the north. Generally, the site slopes from west to east down to the system here. So you can actually see the contours here. It's a nice even uh, grade going across the site. We have received, uh, we have asked for reviews and have received <coughs> letters from the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry from the Natural Areas Program. And they have indicated that there are no rare botanical species on this uh, piece of property. We've received a review from the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife that there are no threatened, uh, endangered, or species of special concern located on this property. We have reached out to the Maine Historic Preservation Commission and asked them to provide us an updated letter. They have already reviewed the Saco development and they've issued a letter saying that there are no historic uh, features there. We have conducted site walks. The properties are very similar. We don't expect to have anybody uh, find any historic, um, anything of historic concern there, so we're expecting to get that letter in hand shortly and when we do we will submit that letter for your review and for your files. As Jay indicated, uh, we are willing and very interested in working with the Conservation Commission. On the back of the property where the resource protection zone is and a little bit further up, we have talked with the National Guard and they are interested in preserving that with a conservation easement that would enhance the buffers around the uh, Saco, uh, uh, Scott, excuse me, the Scarborough Marsh estuary system. You can see the in red outlined here is the parcel at the tail end of this property here is where we would be looking at the conservation easement. Everything highlighted in yellow here is either owned by the town of Scarborough or the state of Maine and it's held in conservation. One of the weak areas happens to be right at this point. It's one of the thinnest areas that there is protecting that stream that heads down to the marsh. So we believe that putting this in preservation and, and keeping it from being developed forever would help uh, preserve the marsh and its uh, natural condition that it's in now. What we're talking about essentially is this type of a building. The National Guard in their funding goes through a very prescribed and rigorous funding request uh, process where they have to fill out forms and say for the field maintenance shop we need to have four bays and six offices and this storage area and that storage area. Most of the FMSs are very similar in their design and this is a rendering of one uh, that has three vehicle bays here. This one would have a fourth one added to it. <coughs> in the middle there would be the support areas and then uh, main entrance and at this end would be the offices and meeting spaces for the folks working in that building. There would be 19 people assigned <coughs> to that uh, building. They typically would work a Monday through Friday 7 to 3.30, 7 to 4 o'clock, so it's very much like a public works facility from that perspective where they come in, 
at the end of the day, they lock up and they go home to the next day. Um, in the front would be the personal vehicles. We've, um, we had submitted a design for the layout of the site when we did the joint main meeting with the planning board and the town council. That was essentially a massing diagram that we had put together to look at the National Guard's program. We knew that they needed a field maintenance shop of a certain size and a readiness center of a certain size and that they needed so much area outside for equipment storage and for vehicle parking. And we put that on the site to represent it in mass. Now, when we did that, we kind of dropped it on there and didn't really pay attention to the municipal lines. And so when we came before the joint meeting, one of the first concerns that everybody raised is how are you ever going to permit a building when it's in two different municipalities and making sure that you go through uh, building site plan review and, and uh, building permits gets very complicated. So one of the first things we did was we reoriented the locations of some of the elements on the site. So we did hear a lot of the comments that you guys had given us and we've, we've wrapped those into the design. We also heard uh, the, uh, Mr. Fairweather, the abutter, his comments and concerns at that meeting about the massing of the building and the visibility of the building and some of his concerns about noise and lights and those were echoed by the, the town council and the planning board. So we've incorporated a lot of the mitigation uh, opportunities into the design and we're going to share those with you now. So this is the site plan that was in your packet. This is blown up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And again, the, to orient you to the far left going north-south is Route 1. Eastview Drive is here. Curves is down here in the lower left corner. So you would come down Eastview Drive and you would drive into the Readiness Center, which is located here. And then if you continued back up through, you would cross the municipal line. And the FMS is now all in Scarborough. The Readiness Center is all in Saco. So there is actually a break in the pavement that we can separate those two projects so that we don't have any concerns as far as trying to permit it in two municipalities. We've oriented the FMS in this manner, and so at the top, facing the vehicle parking here for the staff, would be the offices, and then the maintenance bays would be on the lower half of the building. And we did that for several reasons. The primary one is to use the building as a screen for the equipment located in the back. So there's drive-through bays, very much like a public works facility. So the equipment being, op uh, being worked on can be parked in the back. They would open the doors, drive it into the facility. This is a conditioned building, so the bays are heated and or cooled. So the majority of the time, those doors are going to be closed, which helps to mitigate some of the noise of the activities inside the building. We put the administrative end on the north side. Again, it's one of the quieter features for that program, so that, again, as you get towards the abutter's house here and then the abutting vacant property up here, the quieter activities would be on this corner adjacent to the abutters. Coming down um, to the back here, this is the area in the back that is a secured area. So that is the area that would have security fencing. The front side has a gate coming into the site, and then you can get up to the vehicles um, for the visitors and or staff working in the building has access here. That's outside of the secured area. So any of the, the uh, barbed wire on top of the fence is going to be screened behind the building so that it's not easily viewed from the abutting neighbor's property. So the original plan that we had had general massing on it, and we heard and we went back and we drafted an earlier version of this, and then I uh, set up a meeting with the, the abutter, Mr. Fairweather, and his wife, and I went to review that with them so that we could see uh, with the revised plan what their concerns were and if we had been able to mitigate uh, any of those at all. So we met and they discussed, um, and I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but Mr. Fairbet with his mouth, but we talked about the visibility and the noise and the lighting again. So we went back after hearing his concerns, we went back and actually pushed the building farther back to the right in this drawing 
another hundred feet away from Mr. Fairweather's house. As it stands in this drawing here, there's in a just over 500 feet distance between the two buildings. There is a, um, a vegetative screen here with an undeveloped parcel of about 235 feet between the two spaces. So we were able to um, adjust it a little bit by getting into, we were trying to avoid cutting trees down on the site, uh, trying to leave as much of the existing vegetation as possible. You can see that a little bit better here. I superimposed the site plan on top of a Google Earth uh, aerial. So you can see Mr. Fairweather's house here. You can see the vegetative screen. The building is here. In this grade area is the parking lot. And you can see we've pushed it back so that we're actually encroaching into the existing vegetation a little bit. We've tried to maintain this green space. But by pushing it back another 100 feet, we can just eliminate just a few of the trees here. And it would work a little bit better as far as giving separation from um, the abutter's property. We've also looked to augment this existing buffer between this vacant lot, should it be developed someday. We were looking to infill this with uh, any of the holes in it with some additional vegetation to enhance that uh, screen. Understanding that um, visibility and sight lines were a significant concern um, for the abutter and for the town council as well as the planning board. We've been working um, behind the scenes, so to speak, to see what we can do to enhance that. And the problem we have is the University of New England is going through the permitting uh, on the front end to make sure that the zoning is uh, consistent with the, the National Guard's needs. The National Guard's money is available to construct in 2018. One of the suggestions that the planning staff had given us is can you build a buffer sooner to give it a, lot, to give it a chance and allow it to grow before you get ready to do the facilities maintenance shop. Well, the National Guard can invest money in the second portion of the work because the money is very specific. It's allocated to the first port portion of the work. So we, we're having a little bit of a difficulty with that, but in the, over the last week, um, we were able to um, structure a deal with the National Guard and the developer on the SACO side to work on creating a berm in a buffer with, before the first phase of the readiness center actually starts. So what we would look to do is when the <coughs> contractor or the developer extends the roads as part of the purchase and sale agreement, he's going to extend Eastview Drive down to the site and then connect it to the Don Marie Drive. While they're mobilized and on site, which is going to be in the summer of 2015, they will take some of the, that material and they're going to uh, build a buffer or a berm along the property line. They blow that up. I normally don't like to walk in with, with new drawings and Jay hasn't seen this and quite frankly the National Guard hasn't seen the final version of this yet. But I thought it was important enough to bring this forward tonight. I broke one of my own rules. Normally I don't do that. But I wanted to make sure that you understood that this was a concern that we understood to be significant. So. Zooming in a little bit, again, the Fairweather property, the house is here. This is where we had a, a planted vegetation. This is now a six foot tall berm that's got a plateau on it that's 20 feet wide. So instead of planting the trees at grade, we would plant the trees on top of the berm to give additional height to that screening. Now, we put this into a profile so that you can see it a little bit better here. It's uh, that's just a, a zoomed in again uh, on the site. The, s the slope, you can see the contour lines. So the slope is going away from the abutter's property at a fairly decent pace. This represents the existing grades. This, and this is a little bit out of scale from a, from a horizontal perspective, but it, it, it serves the purpose. This would be the facilities, uh, the FMS building here, uh, approximately 35 feet tall. This would be the berm, six feet tall, with the trees uh, planted at about seven feet on top of it. Going upgrade, this would be a six foot tall person standing in the backyard of the Fairweather's property. So from a perspective, you can see that with the berm and a five foot tree, or seven foot tree, excuse me, 
the sight line would come down to about here on the 35 foot building. If we give this four years to five years of growth, you're going to gain another four or five feet of elevation on those trees, which when you stand there and you follow the tree line, you are now looking at the very top of the building. So by having this vegetative screen on top of the berm installed before the first phase of development goes on, gives the screening time to grow in and be in effect when the construction actually happens of the FMS down the road, be it 2020 or beyond. For every year that goes by before that development happens, the more um, the screen is going to develop and actually be effective. It could also serve to screen the construction activities of the FMS so that um, Normally, the landscaping goes in towards the end of a construction project. This would be put in ahead of time, would be um, well out of the way of the construction, and then they would be able to let it grow and, and uh, thicken up prior to the development of that site. So I felt it was um, important enough to, to bring this forward, and I apologize for not submitting it with the package, but I think it was important for you to understand that this is something that is um, recently developed that was worthy of hearing tonight. So back on the on the site plan. Um, this is a photometrics plan of the total site. So you have the readiness center here at the south. And on the north side you would have the FMS building. You've got the personal vehicle parking here in here for the readiness center with the vehicle equipment outdoor storage areas behind the building property line along the top here this was done using one of the standard light fixtures that the national guard utilizes it is an led fixture that is um, with zero up lighting this plan illustrates that you can illuminate that site at the appropriate levels without spillover onto the abutters property. Now there is, uh, there was a comment in uh, the planner's comment that we use 25 foot poles and that is correct in this drawing. You could easily swap those out for 20 foot poles and have the same effect with the personal vehicles on the front. On the back side, uh, if we put in 20 foot poles, we would wind up putting in additional poles in a large area where they're trying to uh, maneuver large pieces of equipment. The 25 foot poles would be behind and below the 35 foot building from the abutters property. So we would, rec we would like to see if we could maintain the 25 foot poles in the back, which would be behind the building, and that would allow us to minimize the number of poles when they're trying to manip uh, maneuver the equipment in and out of the maintenance facility here. We added a couple of pages <coughs> of some uh, gener fairly generic um, stormwater details based on uh, low intensity design. The National Guard with their stormwater programs utilizes that so that they can minimize uh, the impact in the infrastructure. So they are willing to commit to that and again on the plan it was very conceptual in that we know that the FMS footprint is going to be very similar. We know that the square footage of asphalt is going to be very similar. So we were able to do some basic calculations on the amount of stormwater that's going to have to be managed. We went through that basic calculations and, and plotted out some um, storm detention ponds and some filtration areas that could handle that on the site. And we're confident that when they go through the final site plan review with you folks, that they'll be adequately addressed from a stormwater standpoint. The National Guard not only has the planning board to consider, they have several other um, regulatory agencies over and above that they would have to consider. They have some federal guidelines on their construction. So they, number one, well, there's a federal law that says they have to meet all state, federal, and local construction um, and site plan review criteria. They also have to meet certain energy um, issues. They have historic preservation. They have Endangered Species Act issues that they have to contend with. 
So they have a fairly extensive uh, environmental review that goes along with all of their programs. So we're pretty confident from a, from a site development standpoint uh, that they can accommodate anything <coughs> that would be required in the town of Scarborough and or through the state of Maine. From an uh, environmental standpoint, they know where the wetlands are, they know where the buffers are, they know where the resource protection zones are, and we can easily accommodate that on this site. This was uh, a quick review of the zoning, and I, I put this up. The existing zoning is here. There is very little change between um, the contract zone that's being recommended and the existing RF zone. Uh, there is no front or side, um, there is no front setbacks or street frontage here, so that's non applicable. And the only other dimensional change is they're looking for a 45 instead of a 35 foot. Uh, building height, which is consistent with what happens to be in Saco, as well as in the town village district, the TVC3, which abuts that on the Route 1 side. So it's um, basically aligning those dimensions with the adjacent parcels. The utilities to the site would be from Route 1 on the Saco side down Eastview Drive and into the site. We have requested uh, capacity to, to serve letters from the um, water company and from the wastewater treatment facility. We have received and have submitted the wastewater treatment uh, capacity to serve. They do not have a problem meeting the needs of the National Guard. The developer on the Saco side has gone through a full permitting process for the entire development. So he's gone through the DEP's regulations, he's gone through the city of Saco's in order to get the contract zoning, and they have submitted all of the utility cap um, capacity to serve letters to the satisfactory um, of the Saco planning board. This development on the uh, Saco side for this parcel is probably four or five lots within that bigger development. That represents about 46,000 square feet of retail, eating establishments, business parks. The um, capacity to serve the development as proposed as part of the Saco development is significantly more than what the National Guard's needs are. So we don't believe that the um, water capacity is going to be an issue. We've just had trouble getting the review letter from them. We expect to get that at any time, and when we do, we will, sub we will submit that as well. So from that perspective, um, we don't believe there's an issue as well. From a traffic standpoint, again, there is a traffic moving permit, movement permit that's associated with the development in Saco. So those four sites, or four to five, sites represent the 46,500 square feet of retail and or office space. So from a traffic perspective, we've talked with our engineers and the National Guard at the FMS has 19 employees, so they would probably have about 20 peak hour trips in the morning and in the evening. From the readiness center, there's only a handful of people that work there Monday through Friday. So the total trips in a peak uh, hour AM and PM is approximately 29. <coughs> If we take a look at the traffic moving permit and we extrapolate out those four to five lots that were included in that, that 46,000 square feet, and we use a really conservative estimate, uh, which is essentially a business type office as opposed to, um, say, a, a fast food retail establishment, a business office is about 1.5 trips per thousand square feet. A retail uh, fast food would be about 40 trips per thousand square feet at peak hour. So we're using the 1.5, and if you do the math on 1.5 per thousand on 46,000, you come up with about 69 trips during peak hour. We're looking at 29 trips. So we don't see this as being an issue from the traffic moving permit that was issued. The amount of traffic, even from a conservative standpoint, is going to be significantly less than it would be if it was developed as, as a business property. So from that perspective, um, 
We don't believe that a full-blown traffic study is required from the site plan review criteria in Scarborough because that's usually kicked in at about 35. And between the FMS and the readiness center, which is actually in Saco, we're only going to experience 29 trips. So when this is brought forward in the final site plan review, uh, even though this is conceptual in nature now, that traffic moving permit in the resolution will be have will, will have been taken care of because they're going to have to go through the SACO planning board and adjust that traffic moving permit to accommodate the weekend activities that will exceed the 35 trips. There's one weekend a month where the National Guard comes to this readiness center on the SACO side. They come once a month and they'll be bringing 100 to 105 people all arriving at approximately the same time. That's on the weekend. So when the SARCO site plan goes forward, they will address that. That's not on the Scarborough piece, but it will be addressed through the SARCO piece. And being on peaks on the weekend as opposed to the weekday, it doesn't look like that's going to be an issue with a modification to the traffic movement permit that already exists for the SARCO development. One of the other concerns that was raised um, at the joint meeting was the concern about uh, spills and oil and, and materials on the site being close <coughs> to uh, the natural resources. The National Guard has um, been established for a long time. They have many, many facilities across the state. Being a state agency and with some federal oversight, they're required to um, review all of their policies and procedures, and they have in place spill containment, spill prevention, containment, and countermeasure procedures for all of their facilities. Those procedures basically address the training and the education of all the people working on that area so that they're familiar with the facilities that they have and should there be an accident or an accidental spill or discharge of a chemical, how you respond to that from an immediate standpoint and what you have to do as far as reporting it. They follow all those protocols and they actually will generate a document for this site based on the specifics of that site, the materials that they have, the conditions that they have, and that will be um, brought forward to all the people that work there. So from a safety standpoint, it's a, generally a, a well-run facility. Now, I can say that because we are interested in the property that they own in Portland. And we have gone through a phase one and a phase two environmental assessment of that site. It's an older site. It's been there since the early 1900s. And a lot of it uh, was used well before a lot of these measures were actually put in place. We went and did the assessment there, and there are no red flags waved on that site. So they've done a really good job of maintaining the site from uh, prevention and, and countermeasures. And if there was a spill, and a few did occur on that site, they did an immediate cleanup and they reported it to the DEP following all the procedures and protocols that were required of them. So when we went through and did our study, the biggest concern I have is there's asbestos floor tile in the building. All of the stuff in the yard is not an issue. So knowing that they have these policies and procedures in place and that these facilities will be designed to meet the current standards, not the standards that didn't exist back in the early 1900s and the 1940s, I'm very confident that they can put in place procedures and protocols and uh, equipment and facility design that will minimize and or um, negate any of those kind of activities on the site. So I'm pretty confident about that. Again, this is a typical readiness center. One of the concerns that was raised is having a readiness center next to a residential property. This is one of the readiness centers in Skowhegan, and you can see it here. The brighter white is actually the building. There is a uh, equipment storage area in the back. And you can see this is in a fairly dense residential neighborhood. It's been in existence for a while, and it's a fairly compatible um, use in that area. And it's also adjacent to some fairly sensitive natural areas. There's a stream running through and another water body here. 
This is um, the Readiness Center in Skowhegan. This is another Readiness Center in Norway, and again, you can see the residential community around it. This is the Readiness Center in Portland. This is the Stevens Avenue Readiness Center. This is their property here. This is the University of New England. Our property goes around, wraps around the tail end of their property, and continues back here. So it's very difficult. It's about over a quarter of a mile to get from point A to point B, thus our interest to go this way. This site here is the FMS on the backside. The Readiness Center is essentially in, on the forefront. This building here is a dormitory, 144-bed dormitory, literally five feet from the property line. So there's a buffer here, and I've been affiliated with that campus since 1989, and I've been responsible for the security and the facilities operation of that site, and not once have I gotten a call from any of our faculty, staff, or students living on the campus that there was too much noise or activity at the armory. They, the vehicle maintenance facility, they're there 7 to 3.30, they go home at the end of the day. They put everything away and they go home. It's a relatively quiet site. Occasionally they'll have, and this is during the day, you can see our parking lots are, are pretty full here. This is their personal vehicles for the readiness center. They've got a few cars here. There's not a lot of activity there that goes on. They have activity one weekend a month where they'll bring 100 people in. They'll generally come to the site, they'll do some training, some classroom exercises, and then oftentimes they'll jump in their vehicles and they'll go out on the road to put what they're learning to, into use, into practice in the field. So while they come there, they train there, then they depart, then they come back the next month for additional training on the readiness center side. The FMS, which would be located in Scarborough, is the Monday through Friday, turn off the lights at the end of the day and go home. So. We hope that we have given you enough information tonight for you to be able to see that we can design a building, a facility, a, a site development that is, one, consistent with your site plan regulations and allow this to go forward to the town council so that they can con continue to consider the contract zoning. With that, I would conclude my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have about it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, it's about 9.10. I'm going to suggest that before we start a public hearing, we take about an eight-minute break and come back at 9.15. 9.15, it is.
Okay, one more <laughs> name. Come on. Can I talk about Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone back to the Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. Uh, our next point uh, in this process would be to conduct a public hearing. And um, to that end, what I'd like to do again before I open up the public hearing, just a few instructions if I might. If you want to speak on this issue, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. Um, <clears throat> We do ask that you try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. And usually at a public hearing, we also ask that if you would, please understand that we hear you when one person talks. And we appreciate the fact that if one person makes a comment, it's being spoken as if many people would have made the comment. Because if you, get it, if you actually take the time to stand up and talk to us, we recognize that your opinion represents that of many. So if you do get up and comment, we ask that you try not to repeat what somebody else said uh, the first time um, and uh, understand that the board has, in fact, heard you. So having said that, I would like to open up this to public comment, uh, uh, excuse me, a public hearing. If anybody would like to make a comment, please approach the podium. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is John Fairweather, 752 U.S. Route 1. <clears throat> Alan, I appreciate the work that you've done trying to accommodate us. But our number one concern at that meeting with you and with the council, and still is to this day, is our property value. And with all due respect, I don't like the berm very much. I don't like that at all. So what we also talked about at the house in case somehow that this thing does go through, which I hope doesn't, is that we talked about full-size trees with small ones intermingled in the middle of it. Um, so we did talk about that. But number one was our property value. So I'm really not sure what to say. I just don't know what to say. But, but if you folks were in our shoes and you knew that the impacts of this zone change would affect your quality of life and almost certainly lower your property value, what would you do? How would you feel? What actions would you take and would those actions be enough? You know, I'm not sure any one of you would want to be in our position right now and have to, to answer those tough questions. But you are in the position to say, no, this does not make sense for this piece of property and leave it as it is for the right application for the land presently zoned. How long is this process for all to realize that such a zone change has no economic value to our town? And I have yet to see or hear why this should be an exception to the rule. <clears throat> this has bugged me since that meeting. But during the meeting that Alan had his presentation, he mentioned that the welcome to Scarborough sign is well past the site before you even perceive that you're in Scarborough. The sign gives you the perception that you're in soccer. So not only am I here to tell you that I don't want this zone changed, I'm also here to tell you that although that sign leads people to believe that we are not part of the Scarborough community, it's about 450 feet from the truth. We are part of the Scarborough community. Our daughter goes to school here. We shop here. We support local restaurants here. Our church is here. I coach community service soccer here. Above all, we pay taxes here. So I'm asking you, my neighbors, don't allow this zone change. It may not affect you, but just know it hurts us. When Alan and I and my wife sat down at that meeting, I just I can't. I want to make sure that everyone knows this. 
he was nothing but a gentleman, nothing but a gentleman. And we were happy to have him in our home. And uh, certainly we welcome back on better circumstances. But I, I did tell him that, unfortunately, Alan, as much as I like you, <coughs> you're our bad guy. And uh, he said, John, I understand, and we're going to push this process through. And I said, good, I hope you do, and I'll wave to you on the side of the street when I see you again. But I'm going to fight this thing till the first bucket goes in the ground. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fairweather. Anyone else? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Turn it over to the board. Mr. Mazur. Yeah. I'm trying to sit here and, and, and put my thoughts together and how I want to present this. Um, first of all, I was at the joint meeting, and, uh, of course, I heard the presentation then, and I've heard it again tonight, and I've heard Mr. Fairweather's uh, comments then and again tonight. What, what concerns me is I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning no less trying to come up with some recommendations and suggestions of a project that isn't going to be done for another four or five years. And I know what Jay is asking us to do as far as making some suggestions or recommendations to the council. Uh, and I have a lot of questions. I mean, I've got a whole list of questions here. But... The fact that this project is way off. So I guess my question to Jay is, is one of our tasks tonight uh, to decide whether or not this is an acceptable project, no less some of the details that would go into it, like all the things like buffering and, and setbacks and stormwater and so forth and so on and so on. What I'd offer in, in that terms is ultimately it's the council's call if this, you know, if the proposed activity meets the standards to be an acceptable contract zone. The planning board had your opportunity at the joint meeting to sort of voice your concerns about the contract <coughs> zoning in concept. At this point, what the board is being asked to tonight is to accept for the foreseeable future that this is moving forward towards a contract zone approval. So what this board's job is to foregoing current zoning is to review the project to see how it complies with or ensure it complies with the site plan review ordinance standards. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the board's charge this evening. Um, and to that end, um, you know, that's where our staff comments, like you just said, it, you know, when we looked at this, and certainly if the plan board wants to get into the detailed merits of a stormwater report at this time, that's at this board's discretion. It, it's, you know, staff sort of tried to take the approach of what is reasonable. If they're not going to build the... Um, if we know they're not going to build the, um, the readiness center for four years, they don't even have funding for the vehicle maintenance shop that they're looking to put in the town of Scarborough, we're at least four years away from putting anything in the earth, and it's probably many more years after that. So does it really make sense to do a detailed analysis of those type of elements that are likely to change? That Certainly, if the board feels that that's important, then that's at this board's discretion. But it seems, at least when staff was looking at that, you know, those are the type of details that could be looked at in the future, four, five, six, eight years down the road when it comes forward. But right now, what seem to be the, the sort of um, the driving elements um, that we thought the board should focus in on are, again, the, the items that I talked about before, really sort of the buffering screening of abutters, uh, defining the parameters of future development, where can, you know, sort of active development occur, i.e. paving and, you know, hard contract work happen, and where can those more passive 
activities, landscaping, berming, you know, the, the sort of softer approach type development occur on site. Um, what's the reasonable impact on the natural resources in the area? Um, and that's, I think, where the Conservation Commission bit weighs in, but certainly any thoughts the Planning Board has in, in those terms. Um, so I think, really, the Board setting the parameters around which a future around which future site details would come forward in is where we're at right now, and sort of making those recommendations to the council as to which items make sense to dial in now as part of the contract zone, such as uh, landscaping and timing of the landscaping, or setbacks, or reduced setbacks, or whatever, whatever those elements are that the board sees, um, and making those recommendations to assure that those details are in the contract zone, um, up front, and then um, so that's that's the direction. That's the best direction we could come up with. We you know, I appreciate serve at the pleasure of the board. I appreciate that, and, and I'm in. It's a dilemma for me, and that's very odd for me, uh, unusual, because emotionally, I hear what Mr. Fairweather has said, and uh, uh, have a lot of empathy for that. But on sitting in this chair with what I'm supposed to do as a member of the planning board, I don't hear anything that's contrary to what you just said as far as buffering is concerned and the berming and, and, and landscaping. So that creates a dilemma for me. But you're also saying that in the final analysis, the council is the one that's going to approve or not approve the the contract zone. So if that be the case, then I don't hear anything, whether I'm for or totally against the project, that I would say no to what has been presented, and presented very well, by the way, by the applicant, um, as far as what you just outlined without repeating it. So that's where I stand, and I'll pass from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. DuPont. I'll pass for a minute. Mr. Fellows. All right. Thank you. Um, I was also at the joint workshop a few weeks ago, and I, I did take the opportunity at that time to ask some questions and express some, some concerns that I had about the merits of this as a contract zone. I still have some of those concerns, um, given the location here and some of the resources involved. Um, I also have empathy for the for Mr. Fairweather, um, and I think that when one owns property that is in a rural farm zone, that there is a reasonable expectation that there are certain types of uses that will that may or may not um, become your neighbor. Um, so without but and without belaboring that too much, I'll, I'll just say that I. I still have some real reservations about the merits of this as a contract zone and, and this particular use. Um, that said, I did appreciate the, the presentation um, and having some additional context and some, some things explained. Um, if this is to move forward, as has been stated and suggested by staff, buffering will be a huge, a huge priority and a huge concern. Um, I do appreciate the the evident goodwill of the applicant in in putting the sort of a preemptive or um, pre-construction berm along the property line with Mr. Fairweather. I I hear that that's, he's not wild about that, and I know that was just kind of put out there tonight. But um, I I think that indicates that the applicant is is is, is listening and 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 operating in good faith, which is definitely appreciated. Um, so again, buffering will be a will be a huge concern, um, and we're going to want to, if we go forward, I think it's fair to say we'll want to see some, you know, something more than just a, a small screen. And it sounds like things are kind of moving in that direction. In terms of design standards and, and reviewing architecture, and again, this is a conceptual conversation at this point, but. Um, I, for one, would, would really want this board to have the ability to have some meaningful uh, review of the architecture. And I do understand that 
you know, we're what I understand the nature of the beast here, if you will, that there there's not a, a wide range of design styles that are typically used in, in this type of facility. Um, that said, I would hope again, given the nature of this site and location and, and the neighbor, that uh, there will be some opportunity for, for this board to have some meaningful review and for there to be some uh, openness to some modifications as appropriate. And I know, you know probably the closest thing that we regularly experience along these lines is when we have an applicant who's representing a national franchise and they come in and they say, well, this is we've got design A, design B, and design C, and if you know, we really went went beyond the call and we came up with a couple of modifications here. And that always I think makes us feel a little bit uh, frustrated and hamstrung. So I would hope that there will be some opportunity to have some discussions there if this does go forward. One question I do have for the applicant is and and I didn't, I wasn't able to glean this from, from the presentation, it's possible I missed it, but in terms of phasing, um, I understand that there are funding questions and some timing issues there, but would there be a scenario in which the readiness center would be developed on the SACO side before there is funding and or permitting for the the maintenance facility? And that's a, that's sort of a, A question for the applicant. Uh, as, as I understand it, the intent of the National Guard <coughs> is to find a piece of property that they can build both of these facilities on. So that <laughs> said, if they walk away from this process with a contract zone that allows the FMS to be built in Scarborough, they would proceed forward with building the readiness center in SACO while they're anticipating future funding to be made available at some point for the FMS. So it's potential that they could go forward with readiness center and still waiting for funds for the FMS at a later date, yes. Okay. Did, I, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I really don't have a, a whole lot more to add at this point. I, I will look forward to hearing uh, what the Conservation Commission has to say after they have a chance to weigh in. I think one of the, you know, you alluded to it during your presentation, one of the balancing challenges will be providing enough distance and buffering from Mr. Fairweather's property without adversely affecting the, the resources more to the rear of the property by moving things over too far to where you're starting to have to really knock down a lot of trees and, and sort of threaten those areas. So. Um, there's a lot going on here, and um, I, I do appreciate the presentation, and um, we'll look forward to seeing how this evolves. Thank you. Mr. McGee. I think I just have to echo um, probably some of, some of Ron's thoughts on this, which is it's, it's an interesting exercise, and this has been a night of interesting exercises, which is we don't really legitimately have anything officially to discuss here. I mean, the unless the council moves on something, and I know you're asking us conceptually to, to picture this being moved forward, but we're being asked to consider a bunch of different varying factors on something that we don't know if will happen. So with that in mind, um, if I could let, stop yeah, I need to let, me, let me stop you be okay. yeah. before you go any further, all right? Because literally we are giving an opinion of this board to the council before they create a contract zone right. with the intent that and hope that items that we bring forth, they build into the language of the contract zone before it gets acted upon. So I don't want you to think that there's really not a well, task at hand for us. There is a big one. The contract zone is not a foregone conclusion at this point. Well, right. that's right. But if, I, and I, if I might just jump in. You're not, you are tasked with giving a preliminary approval. The of what we're seeing here with the buffering and... What the contract, what the zoning language says mm -hmm. is the board is tasked at this step, step four of ten, mm -hmm. with providing preliminary approval of the application that it meets the site plan review ordinance requirements. That's where staff was suggesting 
we recognize that you can't, we're not doing a detailed stormwater <coughs> analysis. A lot of these detail items that we typically get into are going to change. You know, lighting may change in four, five, six years. There might be different light fixtures. But that's where I think we, the board can create a preliminary <coughs> approval that sets the parameters for what future and if the board doesn't want to go down that path, that's fine. This is your decision. This is your, 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 your process. If you want to go down the path of doing a detailed analysis of stormwater, that's, <coughs> you know, but it just doesn't seem, when staff looked at that, it seemed to have little merit, understanding that projects over the course of years, if, you know, if it's more than six months before some of planning board approval to when the contractor comes back for a building permit, <coughs> things have changed. Um, and so we think that, you know, again, um, yeah, I've said it, that, that, you know, you can sort of set what are going to be the cr critical conditions, if you will, to mitigate the, the adverse impacts. And if the board's, you know, not satisfied with that, then we can sort of uh, backtrack and redress and take a second look at this. But. So, yeah, going back to, thank you, by the way, uh, going back, to, I guess, to what Ron's comments are, which is I have uh, a great deal of empathy for Mr. Fairweather and um, your situation. And sitting here as a planning board member, we have to consider what we have in front of us. And at this time, um, I think I have to say I appreciate the fact that um, the Army National Guard and the UNE have worked um, with Mr. Fair Fairweather here to establish the the buffering, um, which the berm, while maybe not the best option, probably could be dealt with um, in a different way that could be somewhat satisfying to the needs of the homeowner that abuts the property. Um, the design of the building, you know, if I were to look at this, it, you know, I think what Corey said, that you wish you had a little flexibility, but understanding that we don't have the utmost flexibility in, in some of the designs that maybe the Army National Guard have presented, <laughs> it's, it's not the ugliest thing I've ever seen. So um, I'll say that much. The, um, it's a difficult situation. I don't, I, you know, this isn't something that you, t you expect to deal with when you sit on this board. Um, oh, yes. You know, I, maybe circle back to me. I don't. I'm kind of lost for words, which is kind of unique for me. Um, so, with that, okay. your turn, Susan. Ms. Oglis? I also was at the um, the previous meeting. I think I made my, my thoughts pretty well known, but I'm going to do it again. I really think contract zoning is spot zoning. I personally don't think that we should be in the business of doing contract zoning. The town did a comprehensive plan requiring a lot of public input, and from that comprehensive plan, zoning was put in place for what we wanted to see in our town, and we wanted that land to be RF. And I have nothing but heartfelt feelings because nobody would buy a piece of property to live in a house if they thought that the National Guard was going to be behind them. As far as I'm concerned, that's it. There is no economic benefit that I can see to Scarborough for this happening. And one of my, I hope that this does get heard by the, by the council because supposedly when you have a contract zone, everybody wins and I just don't see what we're getting. Having said all of that, I do understand what the um, charge is to me in this position. And there's not much I can say. I do believe that should this come to pass, by the time that it gets to the planning board, we'll be able to deal with it. We've done things like this before in terms of taking pieces of property that we have questions about and concerns about and made it work and I think we're skilled enough and we're conscious enough to be able to do that. I'm very concerned about, con about um, national resource, um, what am I trying to say, impacts. 
we go out of our way. I mean, how, were you here when we spent how much time talking about open space and wetlands and wetland impacts and all that jazz? If there's one thing we do in Scarborough is that we take care of our wetlands. And that includes anything that looks like a marsh. And this property is on the edge of a major feeder that goes down into the marsh and has not been the healthiest feeder in the face of the, of the Scarborough um, landscape in times past. It worries me. I'm not concerned about the oil. I'm not concerned about, I mean, I know, I know enough about how that gets done that it's safe. I'm talking about wildlife impact. You know, simple little things like, I'm looking for that letter, where was it, that said, um, according to the information, there's no rare botanical features documented. But, you know, I mean, when the applicant made the presentation, it didn't finish saying, you, you, you may want to have that site inventoried by a qualified field biologist to ensure that no undo undocumented rare features are inadvertently harmed. So even the experts don't really know what's there. I'm sure that nothing is going to happen unless we are absolutely positive that everything has been checked 18 ways to Sunday. So my charge, my feedback to the, to the council is if they decide, and thank you, I don't have to make that decision, but if they decide they're going to have a contract zone here, my concern is wetland impacts, wildlife impacts, um, I know we're going to be getting the um, Conservation Committee involved, thank goodness, but anything that has to do with conservation, this is on the very edge of what we call Scarborough to be about. And we're going to put a National Guard training center there. This makes no sense to me, but I think that we can probably make it so that sooner or later, you know, we'll get it so that it's right. I'm very concerned about the timing of part one and part two, because there really isn't much that we can do until, you know, it gets close enough so that we can actually start to get our hands into it. It's interesting to me that soccer is all, all sewn up, and, and we're just now getting a chance to look at this. I find that all very interesting, but again, I, national resources, buffering, obviously, anything that can be done and everything that anybody can come up with that, needs to, that can be done to protect the private property, a house that's right there, is something that's enormously important. And as a member of the planning board, I will want that probably is where I'm going to be looking most carefully. I, I trust that the roads in and out will be done properly. I don't have any concerns about oil and all of that stuff. I don't think it's going to, you know, the, the, um, the fencing is what the fencing is. I don't have those kinds of concerns. I think that we can take care of whatever it needs to be taken care of. But it's going to take a long time because there's a lot of unanswered things out there that have to do with our job. And one of them is national, I mean, um, um, nat natural, not national, natural resources. <laughs> and um, buffering and making sure that the person who has the building that is in keeping with the zoning is not kicked out onto the, having his property become <coughs> not worth anything when he's living up to the zoning and this is something that has nothing to do with the zoning. So that's a whole mixed bag, but it's a very difficult place to be. I don't know what it is they really want us to say at the council level. I just think it's difficult. I think it's emotional. I think that we have the skills to make it work if that's what the council wants to do. But I sincerely hope that they don't do it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question yeah. for staff. Hy <coughs> hypothetically, just something that dawned on me. Let's assume this project doesn't go through, Jay. It's an RF zone. Somebody else comes in and wants to do something with that property. Would it be, as it is now zoned, strictly residential? It's RF. It's RF. It's RF. So uh, principally the allowed uses in the residential zone are, uh, in the RF, F. are residential, uh, commercial farming. Uh, I'd have to pull out my zoning book and I could go through the list of permitted uses, probably so I don't shoot from the hip and forget any. Um, Commercial agricultural, uh, commercial animal 
husbandry, farm stands, agricultural product stores, agricultural processing facilities uh, with a total not more than 2,000 square feet, bed and breakfast, single family detached dwellings, two family dwellings, a single multifamily dwelling with four or fewer dwelling units on a lot, residential recreational facility, nursing home, home and boarding care facility, accessory <coughs> uses, family daycare homes, golf course, municipal building and uses, place of worship, day camp on a lot with, great, with at least uh, 10 acres, forestry, commercial uh, stables. Um, so those are the permitted uses, and then there's a list of special exception uses. Okay. For Mr. Fairweather, okay, let's assume, just for the sake of argument, this doesn't go through. Uh, one of these may go through. Something will go in there, is my, my comment to you. And would you be more comfortable without, um, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, with any of those other potential entities if this didn't go through on that property? Because something will go on that property. It's not going to remain but vacant. <laughs> If you, I would need you to be at the mic, please. We've read that same paper that Jay has just spoke of. Um, so we, we've always known that, you know, we live in a in an area that's subject to growth, um, that kind of growth. Um, so yes, sir, we we would welcome an agricultural place. We would welcome farmers or a farm stand something of that nature to, that would keep us part of the country setting look you know that we actually live in um, so yes yep we would welcome it. Mr. DuPont very difficult here I'm certainly not in favor of this project at all and this board can do a lot of things as far as buffering and landscaping and everything else but we can't mitigate the fact that this is going to have adverse effect on this person's property value. Plain and simple. This board recently just passed a, just a simple little subdivision with three lots, and two of these members voted against it because they're concerned on a runoff on just these two lots. What's the impact of this going to be? Is there anything, any benefit here for the town of Scarborough to change this zoning? There's not. There's no tax dollar. We get an impact fee for traffic based on what? 29 during whatever time, and then 100 on the weekend? What's that going to do to Dunstan? It's a major impact on this community with no benefit for fabric. Enough said? You would defer it as well. I just want to give everybody a chance. Yeah. Uh, Susan helped put some of my thoughts, you know, back in order in my brain. Thank you. Um, she she really did a nice job of, of basically summing up real really the the problem with this, which is we have you know the tools and the talent to work with whatever we get handed from the council, and and that's I think that's what I was trying to say before. Not that. We didn't have an impact on this process until the council did something about it. What I'm saying is we're really kind of, you know, if, if they send it our way, then we're going to do the best that we possibly can by Mr. Fairweather. If, if it doesn't come our way, then we'll deal with it at that point, you know, and, and, and we'll deal with whatever goes in there next. I just, I think I'd like to reiterate that comment, which is I, I wish, I wish, uh, I wish you better luck. Um, uh, on this process, mm -hmm. and it, whatever happens and ends up in front of this board, uh, I suspect we are going to be, uh, it's going to be under heavy scrutiny no matter what it is. That's it. Can All right. So our, our task here is to give preliminary approval? It's part of that. It's a possibility. If the board so desires to want to do a preliminary approval uh, for the project and give that recommendation, to the town council, then certainly that's one of the things that we can do. If we 
opt not to give that approval or if we opt to get more information mm -hmm. before we give that approval, that's certainly within our right. All right, thank you. We'll see it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Can I, I, can I clarify something real quick? Are you going to be asking us to take an up or down vote tonight? I haven't even given my comments yet. <laughs> oh, <I'm not> even <laughs> <laughs> Give the man a chance. Can we, can we take another break? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe afterwards, right? We may need one. Um, you know, first of all, what I want to do and say, quite frankly, is that I want to thank the active military, the reservists, all of our veterans for their service to this country. And we understand that facilities like these are needed and required in order for you to be able to do your job to keep us safe, and I thank you for that. Having said that, I wanted to get that out of the way first. I'm a short timer on this board at this point. This may not come back in front of me, which might be a good thing for some people. Um, but I definitely want to express some of my concerns and get some of my comments into what I feel hopefully becomes notes that goes to the town council prior to any of their approvals. And contract zones are different from anything else that we deal with as a board, and I think that in my nine years I may have seen two others. Um, and I say that they're different because one of the comments that I've been hearing the board members say, and with much respect from uh, Ms. Auglis, is that <coughs> we can deal with whatever comes to us. Well, the fact of the matter is, unless I'm mistaken, in a contract zone, the town council can approve any building that they want to approve regardless of what any of the building design standards say. They can erect a building that they want to erect that's totally different than any other building in this town. So we may not, as a board, get as much um, flexibility as we think we may get in terms of the design of a building or the flow of a site. Now, I do think that they'll listen, but I'm just saying that literally the decision is in the control of the town council it's not in the control of the planning board other than our recommendation to them. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that to be the case. The planning board can, as I sort of stated before, part of the preliminary review process, and again, this is going back to other processes which are more linear than this one. The board has really, frankly, reviewed to the nth degree all the proposals. And so in the contract zones, it states that the projects shall be developed in accordance with a site plan approved on X date by the planning board. After the contract zone, they basically come back to the planning board for a perfunctory blessing, if you will, final approval. This is very different. Um, at least the process we have laid out right now is very different. Again, at the discretion of the board, if you want to try to get into more detailed merits and you feel that that's necessary um, for the host of the site plan criteria, we could go down that path. Mm -hmm. All right. so. so in continuing my comments, the interesting thing about this is we know that this project, potentially the first phase of this project is four to five years away funding for the second phase of the project, which actually would sit in Scarborough that we would be discussing this evening or is potentially longer. The reality of it is there may not be any person sitting here tonight on this board that will be here when this review occurs. That potential exists. So my thoughts would be if this were to ever get to a point where the council starts putting things down on paper, I would like to see them make sure <coughs> that any kind of buffering that gets done between what is now the Merriweather Project 
um, and the potential of this site development that the landscaping berm and trees be erected as quickly as possible. I would agree with Mr. Merriweather that the trees should be larger than five to seven feet. Fairweather, excuse Fair me. Weather. I apologize. Um, that the trees should be larger than seven feet at this time or five feet at this time, and that we should put as many infill trees as we can to try to protect the buffering on this site. Um, I would ask that the design standards that are in effect at the time that the facility would come in front of this board for approval be the design standards that are in effect of the of the time of that showing up, not necessarily the design standards that we have today. Um, I would ask that the applicant find ways to reduce lighting during the evening or, or after hours time in their parking lots by providing the correct circuitry now and not having to try to do something later. It's a lot easier to put two wires in a pipe than it is one. Um, or just as easy, I should say. Um, certainly, we need to hear from the Conservation Commission. Um, I would like to see that the final site plan and architectural review does, in fact, occur by the Planning Board and that we can do our best to try to protect any abutter should this project go ahead. Um, <coughs> I would also like to see the wetland buffering be part of that recommendation. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how sites get developed. And I see some developers in the audience, so I know that they're going to understand what I'm saying. But I don't think anybody ever says, we're going to put this building here and then five years from now build the building. I don't think that happens. I think what happens is a piece of property becomes available and people try to decide what the heck can I do with that? How can I make a buck at that? Right? And that's, that's fine. I mean, right? That's, there's not any issues with that at all. So I think this project is in front of us at this particular location because a piece of property came available and it might make sense to maybe build something there. Is this the right thing to build there? My personal opinion is no. Do I think that this facility could go somewhere in, in the town of Scarborough? Absolutely, absolutely yes. Um, I'm not convinced, as I know some of my fellow board members feel the same way, that this is the right spot to have this facility in our town. Um, but that's my personal opinion, which I really can't, other than state to you, have it become part of my decision-making process as to how I act on this board. Um, I'll have to become a counselor to make that work. <laughs> and I appreciate that we have counselors here this evening as well, so thank you. Um, ultimately, do I think that the property or the site plan that was presented to us this evening meet the intent of our ordinances? Yes, I do. I think that the, the applicant has looked at the proper buffering, the proper design. I think he's gone out of his way to try to make the best possible solution on this site, and he is, in fact, following our ordinances in the process of doing so. So if I have to sit there and raise my hand at some point and say, do I think it meets the intent of our ordinances, I will raise my hand. But at this point in time, I do not feel that my fellow board members <coughs> are quite ready to make that happen yet. And so what I would like to suggest is that this come back to us before we make our final um, recommendation to the town council. I think the applicant needs to meet with the Conservation Commission. I think they need to review, take another look at the plans and the locale and pin down um, some of the extent of the development areas that we've talked about tonight, some of the buffering 
if there's a possibility to look at any additional uh, potential, what the architecture really would look like, uh, some of the landscape, can we get some visuals potentially of what <coughs> really the true one affected abutter is going to have to look at? Because this is totally different from most projects that come in front of us. I mean, this is this is obviously a very unique project. Um, and um, so I think it would be good to see that. Um, and lastly, in terms of what I would like to say to the council in the event I don't get to say it in the future, is before you approve this contract zone, go stand on Mr. Fairweather's property and take a look. Look at the impact to him and his family. You know, he's got nice home, beautiful backyard. You can clearly see what he's looking at now and envision, if you will, what this site may look at and ask yourself if this was my home, what impact would it have on my property value? And then make your decision. That's all I have to say. Susan? I'd just like to agree that I'm not sure exactly what it is we need to ask for, but we're, I don't think this board is ready. I know I'm not to raise my hand. I mean, I just want to agree with you. I, I think that this is not the time to make any kind of a absolutely or absolutely not. Again, I think we need to hear what the Conservation Commission has to say. Clearly, that's one of the items. Um, and in terms of any kind of visual that we could possibly see from a couple of different angles, I think I would, would be like helpful. I would like to put in our recommendation or whatever goes back to them as a result of this evening's meeting that your suggestion, I, I, I know you didn't mean it as a suggestion, but I would like to suggest to the council that they actually do individually, not as a council, but individually go out to that piece of property. And not only in terms of the abutter, the, the, the present owner of, of the house, but also just that piece of property. And remember, it's, it's, it's zoned RF and just stand there and look at it and and then pay attention to what we're being asked to do. I think that would take care of a lot of questions. Okay, the only, only and I agree with all that, but again, and that's why I asked, asked him the question, somebody will put something on that piece of property. I do know that. Um, we've, we were all part of the dis determining factor as to what it was going to be zoned, and I know it's RF. I'll throw in there real quick that a 45-foot tall balloon hanging out in the back wouldn't be a bad idea because that is larger than anything you'll build in an RF zone. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Fly a balloon and see exactly what the height would be yeah. of the facility, as we spoke about earlier. And, Mr. Chairman, this may be kind of a formality or kind of an administrative thing, but I'd like to ask that staff make sure that the council receive the minutes of this discussion. Even though we didn't finish our work? Well, I think we did. But I'm well, sure there will be some, some some headlines from the discussion, but just to make sure that, that the body of the conversation is there. <coughs> we can prepare that and present that? Yep. Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Yep. yep. So, uh, actually, I do want to just to clarify question here. Um, so we did hear, you know, you gave some, Mr. Chairman, some direction as to what to come back with before the board's ready to make your preliminary approval or preliminary findings, I'll call it. Um, so the applicant will be coming back to you. You do want to hear what the Conservation Commission has to say before you make your any recommendations. The one thing um, that did come up uh, had to do with sort of flying the balloon to see what the 45 foot is that something the board is interested in going on a site visit and seeing? Is that something you would want represented in a photo uh, rendering uh, sort of backdrop with the proposed landscaping and berming? What's the intent of the balloon? Because uh, I, I felt like there would seem to be general board agreement that that was a good idea, but I think we to should what go point? With, I to think what council end? Council and the planning I think it should be a together. site visit. I personally think it should be a okay. site visit, as I said. Yep. Earlier this evening, pictures are great, yep. but they can be misleading. 
Okay, so we can and work on a site like visit, that. physically see it, get an understanding of Perfect. what the size is of this and the impact to the area. I think would speak volumes in terms of is it right for this site or is it not. <coughs> and we would like to invite the council to come with us. We'd love to invite the council to come with us. There's nothing, we don't, I shouldn't say, I was going to say we don't do that very often. I haven't been around that long this time, but every time I take a site visit, I learn so much more about what's actually happening with this particular item. And I think this is a perfect example. And, we need to go out and, and be on the land. In a recent conversation with Chairman Sullivan, I know that he is interested in trying to do more um, to get the two boards together at times to become more effective. So I think that he would be receptive to this. Okay. Staff will work with the applicant on timing of, an, of a site. Design. Out of curiosity, would the applicant also be on site as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And typically what we try to do is have the applicant pin or stake corners of buildings, corner uh, <laughs> extent of development, uh, maybe maybe uh, center line of a road, but that's more if we're doing a subdivision. Anyway, we'll have them stake out some of the critical elements so the board can have a sense of where things may be starting and like I said, we can and work, not, work through that. Not trying to have this be something to slow everything down to a, to a snail's crawl here, but the other side of the coin is, is this is Maine. November is rapidly approaching. So the sooner we can get out there, mm -hmm. the better. Absolutely. Yep. I also think that it would take care of the fact that there, is, there are not a whole lot of things I can come up with in, right now in terms of suggestions because I haven't been on the property. I don't really know how close it is to the ravine. I don't know how close it is to the potential deer yard. I don't know any of that. And so I think it would be an excellent idea to go and actually be on the land. Thank you. I think it would be a worthwhile adventure. Soon. Okay. Yeah. We have our marching orders. At least I feel like I do. Yep. Okay. Questions from the applicant? Uh, no questions. Do you want me to try to respond to some of the questions that you posed? Okay. Or save that for another time? I would save it. Okay. Let's go to the site visit and if you want to have, you know, we can talk about maybe potentially those at that time or talk about the site and then have those questions answered at our next meeting if we can make everything happen that quickly. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <coughs> John, if I hear anything on timing, I'll let you know. Yeah, we'll get yeah. Yes, they'll uh, revise submission. You got it. Okay. And the mints down. There we go. Exactly what's needed. The Nolan could have some fat and some Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, if I could. Yeah, right. Right. We'll continue to move on here. Item number eight this evening: South Coast Community Church requests the uh, review of the following: an amended subdivision plan of the South Coast Community Church, and an amended site plan of the South Coast. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh, excuse me, a subdivision plan, and, a, and the second one is a site plan. Right. Okay. All right, my apologies. First. Mr. Chase. That's quite okay, Mr. Chairman. So, yes, uh, these are <coughs> two uh, companion applications. So, you know, we'll ostensibly speak to them uh, uh, as one element, but uh, they are two. There is a site plan component and a subdivision component. I'll start with the site plan component and that the church is currently located on uh, 
14 plus or minus acres. I don't recall offhand. It's been a long night. I'm sorry. Um, and, and that site is subject to a special exception approval by the Board of Appeals and a site plan approval by the Planning Board. Where they're looking to modify the lot on those approved plans, they need to be amended. So for the Planning Board, it's frankly a fairly straightforward site plan amendment because None of the uses of the church are changing, just how big the lot around the church use. Um, however, uh, when staff began, began reviewing this application, it sort of dawned on us that this also it has a Zoning Board of Appeals uh, component to it as well, and because it's a special exception use in the RF. Um, we just talked about what type of uses are allowed in the RF. Um, a church is a special exception, needs to go back or received a special exception approval from the Board of Appeals. So before this board can make, take any final action, the applicant will need to go before the Bo Zoning Board of Appeals to get their special exception approved. That, uh, I believe they're on the application for the Zoning Board. In the next week or two, they'll be heard. Um, so tonight, really, this is we're going to look at this as sort of a, a sketch plan concept um, and, you know, with the potential for moving forward with a approval or at least a decision at a future date. Um, but at this point, until we have the Board of Appeals decision, this board can't act. With that, um, uh, now I'll talk to you about the, the subdivision. This is in the RF. South Coast Community Church received original subdivision approval back in 07, I believe it was. Um, for a 10 lot residential conservation subdivision design subdivision. So you can actually see on the plan before us, there's a large uh, open space to the back half, look, identified as town open space, and there's town access um, through the homeowners association open space. Um, the church, as I indicated before, maintained about 14 plus or minus acres with the original approval. I believe at that time the church leadership had uh, uh, ideas of expansion of church activities. The new leadership isn't seeing the same vision for, for their future, is happy with their existing setup, um, and now would like to subdivide some of the remaining land. So ostensibly, uh, this becomes a subdivision amendment, and how do the three new lots fit into the existing subdivision? Um, all that being said, uh, staff has reviewed the application uh, through, again, the RF provisions and Section 7A, the uh, Conservation Subdivision Design uh, Review Guidelines. Um, and ostensibly, the one question we really have in terms of, you know, sort of conceptual design layout has to do with the layout of Lot 14 and how it complies with the uh, conservation uh, subdivision design uh, requirements in terms of lot layout, um, in terms of clustering, maintaining large contiguous open spaces where feasible. Um, so that's, you know, in, in, in terms of layout and conceptual planning, th that's really the uh, main thrust of our comments. We had some other comments, of course, um, which I'm sure uh, will be touched on as we go forward. Um, just want to point out that uh, we did receive an email from a Michael and uh, uh, Mora uh, Collins of 7 Tamarack Lane uh, with some in which they expressed their thoughts on the application. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Peter Beagle. I'm with Land Design Solutions, and I'm here with the uh, South Coast Community Church. Uh, with me are... Uh, multiple members of the, uh, the church leadership and uh, the pastor, uh, Travis Bush. Uh, if they can help me with uh, any questions if, uh, if needed. Um, as Mr. Chase said, the, the original approval was 2006-2007. Um, I actually was uh, working for site design at that time and was the project manager on this project. Uh, site design is involved um, again, in this project, as is Northeast Civil Solutions, who was the surveyor of record uh, back at that same time. So we we have the same team, and, and we're trying to remember everything uh, everything that transpired uh, at that time. Uh, the the church uh, did retain 16.4 uh, acres originally, 
there was uh, approximately 10 additional acres of uh, open space. We had the 50% threshold because we were a required uh, conservation uh, subdivision zone. Uh, in coming uh, back to you uh, this time, the, the, the church originally thought they might potentially expand with a ch more church uh, function on this side. And well, this is this is the original. Um, back in here, and thought they had no idea what it may be, but they thought if the sanctuary should expand, uh, conference, uh, youth center, there was there were a host of uh, different things. Uh, this side was looked at slightly differently, uh, maybe ball fields, uh, something more um, passive. In, in all. Uh, uh, there was a point of discussion with the planning board that whatever these uses were, they had to uh, uh, be complementary to uh, a residential uh, res residential development. And you'll find that's one of the uh, notes uh, on the plan. Um, the leadership in the church today does not feel that the geometry and the layout, they are not interested in expanding over on the side. They do not feel that it makes sense. Uh, they were approached by a uh, buyer who said that they would be interested if the church was interested in selling this land, um, and there was uh, they have uh, financial reasons that that would be of uh, a big benefit to them. So that's what has got us here today. The question that Jay brought up about the uh, the layout of our three lots. And these would be the three lots. We've taken the, the 16 acres of the church land, which is the, the purple, the yellow, and the tan. That was the original church land. And we've broken that up into two lots on this side and this lot, number uh, 14, over here. Uh, these two lots seem to make sense. They abut the, uh, the church property. There's an easement, a stormwater infiltration <coughs> basin right here, which really forms the the border um, of this open space over here. So that that is why we have the shape of this lot. Um, down here, we have a finger wetland that comes, uh, and we actually have a culvert that crosses the road here. Uh, so we have this little wetland. We have a 25-foot no disturbed buffer around that. Um, septic systems, which are private subsurface septic systems, are a bit of a challenge on the site. Uh, we have. Um, septic systems right in this area. Um, but the main reason for this lot here was that this being an amendment and having sold these lots previously, we were trying to provide some buffering to this lot number four. And we thought if we put this lot here, then we've provided some buffering here and we have buffering on this side. So I do uh, understand uh, Mr. Chase's comment uh, but we thought by doing this, um, we could strike a, a balance of uh, respecting a buffer that had been there before and um, at the same time uh, creating a decent uh, lot. So we would uh, appreciate any guidance or thoughts that you folks have uh, on that. There's no size-wise, the, the math and the calculations work, that it's not really a problem for us to extend the lot over if we're concerned about abutting this lot number four with our lot. We do have to some, configure our lot so that we can utilize the septic, the soils over in this area. That, that's that's our, uh, our challenge, if you will. Um, we were proposing the TAN, uh, retain, which was originally the church uh, retained land, that that would uh, be in added to the homeowner's open space, which is the dark green, that it would go to the uh, homeowner's uh, open space. And we are currently um, working with the church's attorney to um, go through the, the homeowner's documents and, and, and uh, figure out just how that uh, would work. The Homeowners Association is responsible for stormwater, uh, the maintenance and inspection of the stormwater uh, infiltration basin and the stormwater facilities that not, are not uh, right along the uh, road. So that would, uh, one of the benefits to the Homeowners Association would be um, three additional lots sharing in that, uh, in that cost. Um, and I, th 
I think that's really our uh, the, the comments that staff had. I did go through those. We don't really have a problem uh, complying with those. Um, and our next uh, submission, will uh, we will include all those. I guess I would add that um, we did, from a stormwater perspective, we did talk with DP, and we do have documentation that uh, they are fine with um, our, our stormwater uh, the way it is, uh, as long as we provide a, a five-year inspection for the stormwater infiltration basin, uh, which we've already done. We have the report written. We haven't submitted it yet, but we will, and we'll make sure the town and Woodard and Kern uh, both get a copy of that. Uh, we'll, uh, we will uh, provide whatever analysis uh, Woodard and Kern would like to confirm that everything is uh, built to size. And we actually, the initial uh, design built in some additional capacity, uh, thinking that the church was going to be doing something uh, in the future. So that uh, capacity uh, should be there. And I guess I'm, that's, uh, I think that's the gist of it. If uh, anybody has any questions or public comments. Okay. We do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. Um, as it comes in front of us this evening, if anybody would like to make public comment, please approach the podium at this time. Uh, my name is Jeff Figue, uh 17 Tamarack Lane. Um, I conceptually have no issue with the uh, church making new lots here, but one of the uh, concerns that I and some of the other homeowners have is just the, uh, and I can touch on this a bit, um, is modifications to the uh, Homeowners Association Declaration, um, which was, I happen to be a title attorney, um, <laughs> perhaps inartfully drafted, which only uh, envisioned 10 lots. So any... Um, <clears throat> Modification in addition of lots, we'll need to fold that into the association somehow. There'll need to be an amendment adding those lots and creating some restrictions for them uh, to keep the integrity of the neighborhood, um, which presumably, and we would expect, is already, but we didn't see any indication of that in any of the documents on file at planning board at the planning office that I reviewed today. So that would be my primary concern, and, and certainly. I'd be interested to talk to the attorney for the uh, church if that was uh, a possibility. But, you know, in concept, we're, I mean, you know, I have no issue with this, and I'm not sure any other people here do either, um, as long as, you know, the, the association and these new lots would be subject to the same rules that we are. Um, they put in some square footage minimums that would be appropriate based on what our homes were subject to. And as I said, I assume that that's been, you know, envisioned by them, but we just want some assurance that that is actually happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vigue. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the board. Would you like to go, Mr. DuPont? I really get too much to say on this at this point. Um, Jay's concern as far as lot 14, I don't really have a problem with that. I know it's contrary to necessarily some of the rules we're supposed to, but we can break the rules once in a while. Uh, homeowner Association language, you addressed that. That's the concern we have. And you were asking existing conditions that we really didn't get anything. Yep. I'd like to see that next round. I just... Oh, um, just to clarify one point, the provision for clustering the lots and having unfragmented open space is okay. in the zoning ordinance. Okay. That w to deviate from those would require a variance. So the planning board has great discretion with site plan review <coughs> ordinance okay. and with subdivision ordinance. This is a provision that's written into the zoning ordinance with which this board has unless it's written in there that the board may okay. vary from it, um, then that's one thing. In, in this instance, the provision that lots be clustered is a zoning requirement, and that's not one that this board has discretion with. Okay. That being said, I guess a matter of us saying whether lot 14 can move up against four and then maybe come around that wetland buffer. That makes sense? 
Uh, yes, if that's, uh, if that's the board's uh, requirement, um, we can uh, we can do that. Again, we don't want wetlands on private property, so that's what I'm saying. You have to work around that piece. That's enough for me for now. Okay, Joe, thank you. Mr. Mazur? No, pass for a moment. Ms. Agnes. Um, I just have a couple of questions. In the new version, um, okay, what is TAN is going to become part of the homeowners association. It's going to be open space. Yes, yes. that would be that would be married up to the start green. Right, right. Okay, except for that piece that is obviously wetland, that one. Up above, in what is yeah, are there wetlands and there is a wet pond. Yes, there's uh, the stormwater infiltration basin is up here. Yeah. There are some uh, uh, a drainage channel up in here, and this is all encompassed uh, by an easement uh, for the town, currently for the town and for the homeowners association to maintain the stormwater okay. uh, infrastructure in here. I, we're not going to be doing much on this tonight except just asking questions, and I don't quite know how that particular piece of property, since it's got all the, it's been owned by the church it, until right now. now it, right yeah. now, it is owned by the church, and the stormwater infrastructure is maintained by the association. By the association within land that is actually owned by the church. Correct. So it, it'll go to be owned by the people who are actually managing it. Uh, that would be correct. That would be correct. Okay. Um, down uh, in this set one over here, the lower purple. Okay, what is that st uh, hatched area down there? That hatched uh, was wetland that was uh, it was man it was a man created wetland by over excavation. There was a lot of so you sand gravel. So you filled it. And so at the at that time, we got a DEP um, NERPA permit. And that was all okay. filled and reclaimed. So it took care of all the wetland except for that one finger that comes down. Yes, yes, which on here is right there. Yep, I see it. Okay. Um, that's all I'm going to ask for this evening. It's going to go to the ZBA, correct? Correct. And then it'll come back here. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McGee. It's been covered. I'm all set. Mr. Mazur, I'll hit you again. Okay. A couple of things. Well, thank you, by the way. Um, the comments by the gentleman as far as uh, fulfilling homeowner association rules and regulations, I hope that would also would come to pass. Yes, that will. It, okay. Um, also, in noting some of the staff notes which I was going over, uh, it said way back when that there were plans for trail and pull-off, and uh, that's never been done according to what the information we've been given. The, my my comment was uh, simply that it, their note still says proposed, where it should read existing. Oh, it's Cause, existing. Cause it, it, it was established. Um, the town does have an easement. We do have, there was the gravel area was developed. The town does have the rights to maintain that trail. Um, so um, it, that, that was, it was really more of a mislabeling than a concern. <laughs> uh, right. I, I took the plan and I put on our new labels and I did not edit the old labels. So that was proposed in 2007. It was built and I uh, neglected to uh, edit that label. Hey, my last comment and question is that uh, from the letter that we received from one of the abutters, uh, there was mention of tree lines and taking down tree lines. What's the intent as far as taking trees down? Well, the church has a buyer to buy those three lots, um, and we don't have any, um, the only restrictions are in the homeowners association, or, or the covenants, do speak of trying not to clear cut. They do give the lot owner the ability to clear for their house, clear for their yard, swimming pool, many things, but they do advocate to try to limit uh, the clearing. Um, we, ha on these plans, we have just proposed to sell the lots and we have left the clearing, uh, whatever clearing to the uh, lot buyer um, 
and working within the covenants that have been uh, set up. And we would be, uh, or my understanding is, we'll be using those same uh, covenants uh, that were submitted and approved and recorded. Um, the only thing that will be different is we'll be adding the uh, three lots into, uh, into that. Um, I do have those covenants here, and I actually I could uh, mm. flip to that section if that would be helpful, where it talks about um, tree clearing. Would that be helpful? No, I think you've answered it. And then my final is, what about the mm -hmm. comment that, the, that when they were told by the original seller when, when they bought their house, mm -hmm. there was going to be a 10-lot subdivision, and now that's exceeded that. Is there any evidence of that, or is that a verbal thing, or was that in writing, or? Travis Bush, pastor, South Coast. I've been there almost four years, January. Uh, we, we actually, I don't believe that was in writing at all, as far as the 10 uh, lot subdivision. And there's always been plans to develop that land into something. And so the, the fact that um, someone told these homeowners, and, and we have no idea who it is now. I mean, that was years ago in church. Um, it's a revolving door. And so we have no idea who would have shared that with them back when they purchased their lots. Um, but we went back, and that is in none of our documents okay, so as far as officially documenting that it was a 10-lot uh, subdivision because there was always plans to improve. And, and, and if I may just kind of speak, we, we spoke on feelings earlier. Um, we have always had a very good relationship with these folks. I hope and pray that continues. Mr. Collins parks his landscape truck in our parking lot every night, and we hope that that continues. Their children use our playground all through the summer. We love that. We hope that continues. And we want to see this neighborhood improved. That's our heart. That's the buyer's heart. And uh, so, I, you know, just if I could speak to any of that for Mr. Collins, I hope the opportunity arises where I can speak to him face to face, because I was kind of shocked by some of the um, uh, comments made by him, considering our relationship uh, over the past four years since I've been there. So, uh, thank you. Thanks for answering that. I'm all done, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Fellows, I haven't forgotten you. No? You get to uh, get clean up here, or almost. 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 Um, yeah, just to quickly quickly build on that last, uh, the last comment of that last uh, exchange, um, not to disparage realtors, but it certainly wouldn't be the first time that a, that a, a realtor sort of assured someone that, oh, that's always going to be undeveloped, or that's conservation land because uh, I've heard that myself. And I, I think ultimately, as, as frustrating as it can sometimes be for someone in, a, in an established neighborhood, when it comes down to it, it is buyer beware, and it's, it behooves you to understand the zoning and understand the nature of the development where you live. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're talking now about, all, you know, moving lot 14 over up against that lot, <laughs> uh, among other things. So. Um, you know, this has always been a conservation subdivision, and uh, that's just kind of the nature of it. So, I, I, but on that, I uh, look forward to seeing uh, how that lot is reconfigured, and uh, look forward to seeing how this comes back from the ZBA. I don't have anything else. All right, thank you, Corey. Uh, just a couple of things, if I could. Um, again, I I, uh, I know Mr. Dupont mentioned it, but I just want to mention it again. Any reconfiguration of Lot 14, please make sure that the uh, – I, I would ask that not only the wetlands, but potentially the no disturb buffer area around the wetlands be removed from private property, if at all possible. Uh, there was a little tiny card, column or space on Lot 14 which had the no disturb buffer area um, in on the actual private property, and if that – need not occur, that would be appreciated. Um, in terms of you making that correction, I would ask that um, there be one other 
item looked into in the event it need be. And if you make that lot larger, does your open space calculation still work? You still have enough open space should you make that lot 14 lots. You don't have to tell me now. I just yes. just make sure you redo the calculations and show calculations on your revised site plan with the open space calc uh, with the new configuration uh, so that we have that down, if you would, please. Um, again, this evening just seems to have been an evening of first for me. You have presented another one, and I, 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 the, I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, we're, we're approaching Halloween, I guess. I, it, something's working here. But this is the first time I've seen a uh, subdivision change that did not require some kind of an amendment of the DEP permitting. So while I don't disagree with you that, um, you know, everything may be fine in terms of the design, I still think that it would be in the town's best interest to at least have some kind of a email, some kind of uh, item written from the DEP saying they're okay without coming up with some kind of an amended plan. Um, I just want to keep the records good. So if you could provide that the next time you come back or be in the process of providing that, that would be great. Um, just in, t you know, you'll probably never have to do this again in terms of this particular site or location, but it's always great that whenever you bring back a revised plan that you actually show us what the original was. It's just kind of a, like, we don't know what you're changing, really, unless we know what was there. So that's more of a comment than anything else, not... Uh, and we talked about the legal homeowners, and I think that you need to have some fun with um, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and we'll get to see you again. I have nothing else unless you have something for us. Well, I guess I just want to make sure. Um, so this, I, I'm thinking we would leave this little, probably leave this little, uh, open space finger in the back, and then lot 14 would look uh, similar to that. I mean, I'm mm, no, I'm, I'm confused. No, I thought the idea was to take that wetland out of. Uh, yes, he's, he's the, the, the red line. The red line goes uh, would be our new border. So we okay. would box that out. So we'd be there'd be part of lot 14 over here, and then lot 14 over here connected down here where I have the red uh, stripes, and that would right. allow okay. us over by our yeah. suitable soils. By ordinance, the property lines have to abut. Gotcha. Okay. The, only, the only thing I would offer in when you take a look at that in, in terms of what uh, Chairman was just saying, in terms of your 50% calculation, that wetland nugget that you're taking out <coughs> wouldn't meet any of the, uh, to count towards uh, open space, it needs to be an acre of contiguous land. So I'm guessing that's less than an acre. Um, so that would probably have to come out of your open space calculation. And if you want to try to maintain that back finger, that, yep, that would need to be 50 feet wide at a minimum to count towards open space. It can still be in the open space, just not count towards your 50%. So just as you're running your numbers um, so we don't have you do an academic exercise, okay. overdo it multiple times. I think we times. have 10, 10 or 11 extra additional open space acres. So I think... Yep. We have uh, room to play so with. So, plenty. so let me ask uh, this I, one then. So this, so we take this out of the lot. So then we just have, I guess, the homeowners Own association it. owns it. So it's just kind of a little rectangle sitting there, I guess. But yeah, so what the ordinance says, and and uh, the board certainly been very consistent over the years that wetlands and their buffers are to be off the the uh, off lots. But what it says is it, they need to be off lots if you want to count them towards your open space. So, you know, the board certainly has, this is where the board does have the discretion to say, you know, keep wetlands out of the open space because the ordinance talks about wetlands mitigation and, and, uh, and trying to have minimize adverse impacts. Um, so I guess, you know, the question to the board is, 
do you, how, would you be more comfortable with sort of that rectangle around the wetlands being part of the homeowner association open space, completely encompassed by lot 14, I think it is, or would you ha be more comfortable having it just be part of lot 14, still have the no disturb buffer around it, that's a DEP regulation, regulation. On the face of the earth, it's going to look very similar. It's just a matter of ownership. Well, yeah, and you know, if you take a look at the, um, yeah, we, yep, we, there we've are got some two, others. We, we, two, we've got yep. two. Right. Those were those were pinned. There's a note with a requirement yes. that those had to be uh, pinned every, I think it was Correct. 25 feet or something. Right. Uh, like that. This was that. done before we got really sticky about yep. not putting wetlands, right. allowing wetlands on on private property. But um, I, considering that there's also already a thing about pinning it, they've got two out there now, by the way, just nod so you don't have to get up and down. Nobody's fooling around with those wetlands. Nobody's filling those wetlands. They're not disappearing. Okay, so yeah. we've got, we've got a, it's, in my discretionary thing is we've got something there that's already in place that's working. So why, why make it even more complicated? Just make sure that it's um, separated off, you know, that it's, not, never mind, I made my point. So your suggestion is just pin it, but do not make it part of the open space, make it part of the property, yep. is what you're suggesting what to I'm the suggesting. board. I know, I know, hey. I'm going against everything you believe in. Look at him, look at him, he's not going to talk to me. i sorry about that. It, no, I, I, I get it. It just seems that in this particular case, you know, let's, let's go the whole way in terms of things you've never seen before. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to be able to make it back. I know. I, <laughs> I know. You're in shock. I am. Anyway, that was just my suggestion. All right. And if that's the feeling of the board, I mean, that's... Well, so I have wetland in my land. Oh, we're we're going to talk about it again when it comes back. So. Yeah, yeah, we will. Except uh, next time, we uh, I think we would like yeah. to be... Um, I what his lot line looks like. We would like <laughs> to... We would be asking for approval, hopefully. Right. So I'd like to... You'd like to know what I'd we like want? To, I'd, yes. He wants to know what we want. Well, what, yeah, I know. What we want is a letter from the DEP. We want a letter I from actually, the I DEP. have that right here. There you go. So we're good to go there. Um, and in feeling of the board on the on the wetlands, just take a straw vote here. I'd go with Susan. I'd go with Susan. Yeah, to me, it's somewhat similar to the kind of grandfather situation yeah. we had earlier tonight. Yeah. So Nick, our opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Make it part of the property. Pin it. Okay. Pin them both. I knew you were for it anyway, Nick. So I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. All right. Our next item this evening, item number nine, was physically removed from the agenda uh, because I actually did an administrative approval on it, as it was a timing issue more than anything else. Um, we needed to either get it on the agenda or I needed to approve it, and we I couldn't it. get to it in time, so Jay put it on the agenda, and I got to it. So okay. that's why it's not on the agenda this evening. That's fine. Uh, next item is the town planner's report. Mr. Chairman, you just stole my thunder on town planner's report and administrative report. So number 10 and 11 you covered for me. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much. Okay, item number 12, correspondence. We talked about it. Well, I, I guess this would come under correspondence. Um, I've got this, and I read it, believe it or not, from the Scalvo Sanitary District. And they brought up for their own discussion uh, Eastern Village. And uh, Mr. Anderson was looking for some exceptions, but uh, the comment was uh, had he come back to the planning board. Uh, and uh, Mr. Anderson explained uh, that it was late in the year and he has to get on the planning board agenda to have them approve and sign a new Milo. That's what it was. So he asked for permission from the sanitary district as far as payment is concerned, uh, and uh, they didn't give it to him. Um, so do you have any update on that, Jay? Um I believe 
I believe what the discussion was was Mr. Anderson was looking to pay his um, uh, capacity reserve fees on a lot by lot basis Correct. rather than on a full phase basis. That you know the the town or the planning board we have a number of impact fees which typically we try to collect um, up front you know at, at the outset. But this board has occasionally varied and allowed it allowed different impact fees to be paid on a lot by lot basis. He took that proposal to the sanitary district, and my understanding of that discussion, the sanitary district declined to go in that direction and help firm to their policy that everything gets paid up front. So it really doesn't. That's the discussion I believe you're referring to. Right. It doesn't impact this board's approval. So. But it, what's the mention, just for my own, I don't know. about the mile? Or, uh, I don't know. Okay. I, without Have you seen this? Uh, not in a while. So, okay. yeah. I don't know. Offhand, I don't want to guess. I just, since we were mentioned, I thought yep. I'd bring it up. Uh, I, sure. I'll take that from you and take a look. Yep. Other correspondence? I have a piece. Uh, I got an invitation to go to Unitil's Main Service Territory Gas Emergency Response and Preparedness Annual Meeting. Whoopee. Um, so they certainly, and in, in this came to the planning board, if you will. So I am not available on November 12th, which I believe is a Wednesday. The meeting is physically from 8 in the morning to 10 in the morning. If anybody would like to go in my stead, then just reach out to me and I'll provide you with the information. So know that that's available. Our next item is planning board comments. Planning board questions? Planning board questions. The planning board policy on peer review procedure for transmission and telecommunication facilities that you talked about earlier, is this just automatically going to be taken care of? Do we have to do anything about it? No, we're going to, if, 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 if we want to adopt this as a policy, we will physically take a vote on it this evening. Ah. That's my question. So. Okay. Um, and I, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, except maybe Mr. Mazur, who I was read, unable I to read, get to the meeting. But, um, Mr. Mazur had a question, though, I think, or okay. a comment. Oh, I have a comment. So well, let's finish with this, and then I'll. Okay. So basically, I mean, coming off the meeting, uh, I think the general consensus was that we take a look and, and review this this evening and potentially enact it. And so uh, why don't I at least read it? Mm -hmm. Uh, into the record, and we'll go from there. So this is uh, for us to review as a planning board policy on a peer review procedure for transmission and telecommunication facilities. Given the significant technological knowledge required to ensure an applicant adequately substantiates the evidence needed to demonstrate compliance with the performance standards for transmission towers and telecommunication facilities, the planning board hereby empowers the town staff to automatically send all applications for review under these provisions out for peer review to aid the board's deliberation of the merits of the application. Is there any discussion? I'll make a motion to adopt what the chairman has just read into the record. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. Mr. DuPont is a second. Any discussion? Just very briefly, I think as we discussed earlier, this is a, a good tool to sort of level the playing field for the board as we are faced with technical items that come before us, and I think it's a great idea. I think it takes away any <coughs> any delay, actually, in terms of us right. reviewing an application. Uh, puts, I think, everybody from the applicant to the town right. on a level playing field and should assist town staff uh, along the way and actually expedite the I process. Think, so, I think it's an example of the kinds of things that we do. Sometimes I hear things like, you know, we don't take into account the developer, we don't take into account, you know, we're, we're anti-business, all that kind of stuff, because we can be pretty perspicacy about details. But this is an example of the kind of thing that, that indicates that we really do take what the applicant needs into consideration as well. They could come and give us an, um, a, a recommendation, and then we, then we send it out. 
So, so you know, they're they're sitting there with three more weeks right. tied up. So this is not only helpful to us; it's really helpful to the applicant. And I think it's something that everybody would approve. Just of. just a general comment, if I could, also in regards to this, I do want to personally thank uh, uh, once again uh, Chairman Sullivan, mm -hmm. the Town Council. He and I spent many evenings on the phone um, discussing this, not just this policy, if you will, but discussing the impact of the ordinance on the planning board, the impact of the ordinance on the town. And I know that he worked to try to um, delay the implementation, if you will, of the policy until I think November 15th in an effort to give us a chance to get organized to be able to put this policy in place before it actually came in front of us. Mm -hmm. So clearly, um, uh, Mr. Sullivan, working with the town council, put forth the effort to try to accommodate us, and I do want to thank them for making that happen. So appreciate that. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. I show that to be unanimous as well. Um, so that is, in fact, adopted this evening. Having said that, I'll give that to you. Having I, said that, I, I will comment. entertain a motion to adjourn. No. I, no. I, I yep. will not be here for the next meeting. I will be out of the country all of November. Okay. So we need to, if Any anybody is not going to be here, please reach out. To Karen, and make sure that we know what we've got for account. I make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. I make a motion. You second. second. We have second. we have four seconds. Is there any good motion? No good main motion. <laughs> we don't need a vote. So we have yeah. <laughs> a motion to second. Uh, take, take your pick. I can make yeah. a motion. Susan motioned. Yeah, take your pick on the second. All in favor. All right. Good I'm evening and thank you. <laughs> You're all in favor.